distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to all of you and welcome back again to the third UFRO Acacia Webinar Conference from Kuching, Sarawak, Malaysia. I'm Anya Ambrose and I will be your MC again for today's sessions. Ladies and gentlemen, we have now come to the third and the last day of the webinar. We have indeed gained a lot of inside knowledge, as well as valuable networking, although the conference is conducted virtually. And again, on behalf of the organizing committee, we would like to express our deepest appreciations to all fellow participants attending this conference. Thank you very much to all of you. Without any further delay, it is now my pleasure to invite again Ms. Anything, the Chief Executive Officer of Sarawak Timber Associations, to continue her role as the moderator for today's sessions on high value added timber product. Please welcome Ms. Annie. Hi, Ms. Annie. Hi, morning. Morning. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, for the session four, the high value added timber product. I have received a, a revised program from the organizing committee that uh, yesterday, unfortunately, we are not able to get connect to Dr. Lamara. Uh, but today we are grateful that he is able to join us either um, through the uh, pre-recording video or uh, personally pre uh, present uh, visually to present his presentation. So this morning session, we will have four presentations. Uh, first, I would like to uh, invite the uh, invited uh, speaker, Mr. Uh, Jamsha Mokta. Uh, he will present the effect of the pre-pressed veneer to laminated uh, acacia hybrid linear lumber, strength and uh, performance. Um, he is currently a senior lecturer with 22 years of experience working as uh, educator and researcher in University of Malaysia Sabah. Uh, he got a master degree in uh, wood industry technology and uh, graduated uh, from UPM in 20, uh, 2000. Um, the area of his uh, specialization and interest related to uh, biomass compost, composite property and utilization and work in the energy characteristics. And uh, currently, he is, his research works focus on the development of green products uh, from biocomposite uh, from cultivated acacia menzium and acacia hybrid and uh, oil palm trunk. Uh, with this brief introduction, I will uh, now invite Mr. Uh, Jan Shan uh, to start your presentation uh, when, whenever you are ready. Thank you. Mr. Zhang Shan, are you yes. around? Uh, yeah, 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 I'm around, yeah. Good. C can you uh, see my uh, slide presentation? Uh, we can. Okay. But uh, you may need to put in the slide mode. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Thank you. You need to press the slide more. Uh, this is a, I think yeah, yeah. the slide more is just next to the 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 phone oh, sign. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You uh, would the next one. <laughs> this uh this bar not uh still appear <laughs> oh yeah, uh, yeah. So i cannot click the slide maybe, presentation would you want yeah. the circle thread to help you yeah sure 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 uh circle thread would you be able to help on the slide you may need to cross sharing 
Secretary, are you there? Anyone there? Yeah, Miss Anik, you are here. Um, we need you to stop share your slide. Okay. Ah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Now you can start your twenty minutes uh, presentation. All right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Miss uh, Moderator, Miss Anything, uh, CEO of Sarawak Timber Association. I hope uh, you can hear my voice clearly, right? Yeah, very clearly. Your voice. Okay, yeah. I try my best, uh, my best to end this presentation within twenty minutes or less. Yeah, it's more better. Okay. Uh, very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, it's an honor to me uh, for today to deliver a presentation. With the topic of my presentation is effect of the pre-press veneer to the laminated acacia hybrid veneer lumber strength performance. Next, please. In this presentation, I will cover a few main points, include the discovery of acacia hybrid uh, in Sabah, uh, the acacia hybrid general characteristic. The importance of pre press veneer treatment, and also we'll, I will cover the objective of the LVL study related on strength performance. And finally, I will cover the strength performance evaluation of laminated acacia veneer lumber. Next. So, as we know, that the acacia breed is the genetic crossbreed between acacia medium. And like I said, Oracle promise uh, this moderate hardwood species is a member of the leguminosae family. As we know that the Acacia hybrid was first discovered in Ulukukut, Sabah in 1971, yeah? uh, according to Raffles 1987 for the next slide. Meanwhile, in Venezuela, Malaysia, the acacia hybrid was found in 1989. But some other sources also claim that Hebron and Shim, they were claimed that acacia hybrid also was found in this Suk district, Sabah, but in 1972. So this makes this very uh, good discovery of acacia hybrid in Sabah itself. Yeah. So, from the other research, from the uh, other re preview research, there's, they uh, emphasize that the acacia hybrid is a crossbreeding within between acacia medium and acacia auriformis. Uh, it would produce a hybrid species superior to its mother tree. And according to the Lorilla, 1992, acacia hybrid is bred through tissue culture, stem cutting technique, and natural crossbreeding. So in my study, I using I use the sample acacia hybrid is based on the natural crossbreeding between acacia medium and acacia auriculopomis. Next, why we study the acacia hybrid? Because the the general characteristic, of, for example, for the plantation species, is one of the fast growing species, whereby the growth rate of acacia hybrid was double of its parental species, which is uh, 22 uh, meter cubic per hectare per year. Yeah. And the ground rate of 12 cubic meter per hectare per year only as described by other researcher uh, like Martin. And beside Acacia hybrid also has better straightness of steam than acacia medium, and it is more valuable and excellent sources of timber with higher density and shape of logs almost around the parent trees. Acacia hybrid also has natural defect, such as not holes, but is removed during manufacturing process. And this makes the, the edibility of acacia hybrid is observed to be a, a result from its two until two times more rhizobium nodules 
than its parent species, as reported by Carr in 2006. Among the most notable characteristic, characteristic of acacia reed is its higher resistance to wolf disease, in particular heart root, a major disease frequently attacking acacia medium. Uh, this was found by Lee Din Ka in 2000. Next. There are several techniques of method of wood treatment that are intended to enhance durability, improve uh, dimensional stability, and minimize drain defect, such as veneer full cell treatment or veneer skin drying, yeah, or heat treatment, and so on. Next. So the what is the, the prepressed veneer treatment? The technique of prepressed veneer had been started over a century ago, according to the Busters 2011. So in this research, a laser, a laser non-mechanical -me treatment, which is compre compression technique, was adapted to, to decentify the veneer for the manufacturing of LLVL panel. According to Chang 2012, Mechanical compression treatment, which is more economical and environmentally friendly, is claimed can increase wood density and the strength by reducing the void volume of the wood. Next. By through the mechanical treatment, the LVL can have a better properties, such as a more effective thermal conductivity, improve the cool bonding of the wood veneer due to better surface characteristic and reduce glue assumption and also decline the pressure of hot press used in the final stage of the laminating process. Next. So the study on the mechanical properties of prepressed veneer of acacia have been carried out yet for the but that's uh, where the research is done. Uh, and because we thought that since LVL has the potential to replace solid wood in all types of application, then this mechanical treatment is particularly very significant. By this research, the effect of pre-pressed acacia with linear on the mechanical properties of LVL will be able to be known in depth. Thus, the result of this study can be used to make the LVL stronger and quality in various uses. Next. So the main purpose of the study was to determine the mechanical properties, which is uh, static bending and compression strength of the pre-pressed 10 years old acacia bit linear level panel. There's a three main objective in the study. First, to evaluate to evaluate the mechanical properties of the pre-press. Linear LVL panel made up of the different tree trunk portion. The second one, the second objective is to determine the mechanical properties of the pre-pressed linear LVL made up of different ply number. And the third objective is to investigate the influence of pre-pressed linear on the mechanical properties of the LVL panel. Thanks. So in, the, in this study, the acacia hybrid ages 10 years old was harvested from acacia hybrid forest plantation in Ulukukut here, which is northern, uh, northern region of Sabah. This one in Kotoblut, in Kotoblut, Ulukukut and Kotoblut. Uh, in East Malaysia, this is uh, Peninsula Malaysia, Sarawak, and this is Sabah. So five sample tree of 10 years old were chosen from the planting area for each diameter class. And the tree is the free from any defect, pest, and disease. Next. So each tree will cut into a tree log portion to represent the vessel portion, middle portion, and the top portion. Both separate and hardwood from each sampling based on height are included in the study. This sample collection are conducted according to the standard determined by International Organization for Standardization, ISO standard 4471-1984. Next.
So the acacia breed veneer sample preparation is from the 10 years old cutting, uh, tree cutting, and then debucking process. After debucking, it's rotary peeling for the standard size, uh, industrial standard size, and then bring to the lab for cutting into a uh, lab scale size, veneer cutting and uh, cutting size. Next. And then the preparation of laminated acacia hybrid veneer lumber is in this study will consist of three processing stage. First is veneer manufacturing, uh, veneer manufacture through rotary peeling method. Second, veneer full strip treatment, veneer drying, and veneer prepress treatment. I will uh, talk about later about the veneer prepress treatment. And the third stage is veneer layup and pressing, including glowing. And the final dimension of elevator panels sample were 300 millimeter times 300 millimeter times 14 thickness millimeter for seven ply and there's a five ply and three ply. In this research, the pre-press of the Akasa hybrid veneer were carried out of 105 plus minus two degrees Celsius for the 30 second and at five megapascal as suggested, as suggested by the Pablo 2012 uh, for the next slide. We can see that there's the, the, the pre-press veneer treatment method applied for this study according to the Pablo 2012. And according to Pablo, when the temperature increase from the temperature uh, from 100 to <clears throat> 150 degrees Celsius, the strength of the plywood also increase. Beside that, Pablo also reported that the higher pressing pressure, the veneer will be smoother surface, hence higher bonding strength. However, higher temperature and higher pressure during the pre-pressing would mean a higher cost of a production. In addition, the pre-pressing time was noticed to have least impact on the strength. 30 seconds of the pre-pressing would be optimum option. In term of costing and time consuming. Thus, Pablo 2012 suggested the 100 plus minus uh, three degrees Celsius for 30 second. And at the five megapascal would increase the mechanical strength of the LVL panel most eventually. Next. This is the process fabrication for the LVL uh, sample from the pre-press and then cold press uh, for 20 minutes and final is hot press for six minutes. This is the final sample for eliminated acacia hybrid vineyard lumber. This one is uh, for seven ply. Next. So after the sample is uh, prepared and the evolution on the uh, uh, on the eliminated acacia veneer lumber it was uh, undergo uh, to test the mechanical properties. We know that the mechanical properties of the strength performance determine the ability of a sample to resist load apply. These properties are vital for different design application by identifying the use of product for either heavy duty purpose, purposes, example, structural and building, or other light duties such as furniture, vehicle, and tool handles. The properties which were tested in this experiment include, yes, include MOE and MOR in static bending test and maximum stress in compression strength parallel to the grain of the LBL. The testing sample were based on STM B1037 06A standard and tested using the machine, universal testing machine. Next. So as a result, for the, from the static bending strength of uh, LVL panel at different trunk, uh, in this research, the basal portion and middle portion LVL show higher mechanical properties than top portion LVL of both pre-press and without pre-press veneer in the MOE and, and MOR for the static bending test, and also the compression strength. 
The top portion LFDL panel has lower strengths, strength are set due to the large amount of crown form with shorter fiber and lower specific gravity than the basal portion of the tree stem. Yeah, the static bending strength, MOE and MOR of the prepares and without prepares, elevated pale sample at different portion and different ply layer was shown in table one. There was significant difference found between the MOE and MOR of the three different portion, basal, middle and top portion and three different ply layer, which is a uh, three, five and seven ply of elevated panel for both pre-pressed linear elevated panel and without pre-pressed linear LLVL, or I will step after this uh, WPP LLVL panel. Next. So this table shown that uh, result of the LLVL panel <clears throat> for the standing, uh, for the bending strength, for the pedestal, metal, and top portion, and different ply of the LLVL three ply and five ply and seven ply. So as we as I mentioned just now, there's a very significant difference between different number of ply in prepressed vinyl lumber or without using the sample without prepressed vinyl lumber. Next this is the result shown that the MOE of the three ply LVL. The MOE of the three ply PP prepressed linear for LVL, it had decreased from 11,456 11, newton per millimeter square for basal portion to 7,721 newton per millimeter square, an average of 3,000. 735 newton millimeter per square reduction in the MOE. Whereas for the without pre-press for three ply, approximately 2436 newton millimeter per square reduction had occurred in MOE from the basal portion to the top portion of the tree trunk. Next. Meanwhile, the MOE of the five ply LVL showed the same trend of decline was also observed in the five ply pre-pressed linear LVL as well as without pre-pressed linear LVL panel. The five ply LVL recorded a reduction of 1,847 Newton millimeter per square for pre-pressed laminated vinyl lumber panel and 1,308 newton millimeter per square for the without uh, pre-press LVL panel. The reduction was found to decrease from the basal portion to the top portion of the trunk, of the tree trunk portion. Next. Um, Sir Jamsa, yes, yes. you have two more minutes. Huh? Okay, okay, okay. So I will pass. Okay, please to show the difference of the, uh, the the result for MOE of the seven ply. Okay, the trend is similar. Next, and for the MOR rupture, also the trending is recorded similar. There's a reduction from the basal portion to the top portion. Next, and also for the MOR for the five. Ply LVL, yeah, it's observed that recorded reduction, yeah, from the basal to the top portion for the both prepressed linear and without prepressed -pre linear. Next, and also recorded for the MOR for the seven ply, yeah, uh, it's also uh, re conversely uh, decrease the MOR from the basal portion to the top portion of the tree trunk. Next. So as a result, for the compression, table two shows the compression strength of the uh, prepressed veneer, LVL, and without prepressed veneer, LVL at different trunk portion and different uh, fly layer. Next. This is a table uh, two for compression strength. There's very significant difference 
for the different ply of uh, LVL and different use, using the veneer from the different trunk of ocean for the prepressed veneer and without prepressed veneer. Next. So these are for, for the, the, the compression strength for the, of the three ply yeah, for the uh, basal portion from uh, three ply, middle, and the top portion. But this trend is uh, almost similar, yeah, but compared to the uh, without prepress, the prepress veneer sample more higher than the, the performance of the compression strength more higher than the uh, without prepress veneer. Next. The compression strength of the five ply had decreased from 6,000 at the basal portion to 5,000. A total around 700 uh, reduction that was recorded. Next. And the compression strength of the seven ply, as we shown, as you can see, figure three, seven ply PPLVL had a decline in its compression strength as shown in. Uh, at the basal portion to the top portion, which recorded an average 5.28% reduction. Meanwhile, the seven without prepressed veneer where an average 2,198 in reduction was recorded from the basal portion to the top portion of the three trunk. Next. So we know what what uh, I observe, we have uh, finding what finding from the research. What the factor uh, influence the strength performance of the LVL is because the prepressed veneer LVL panel uh, influence the strength performance at different uh, strength performance of prepressed veneer LVL panel at different trunk. Uh, portion. So we know that the basal portion and the middle portion level higher mechanical properties, whereby the top portion is lowest strength, according to the Burden 1964. Due to the large amount of ground form, shorter fiber, lower specific gravity, the middle and basal portion of the system uh, is influenced to the strength performance. And according to the Zhang, the microfiber angle MFA of the S2 layer of the fiber cell will be higher. Will be higher MF, uh, microfiber angle will lead to a lower strength in MOR and MOE. Next. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Uh, Jamshad, uh, is your, can you make the sum out the final? Okay. All right, all right. So the, so I can see that uh, we can uh, conclude that next. Bending strength of LVL mat from the LVL of the veneer, synthetically different by different ply of num uh, different number of ply and different uh, trunk of portion used to produce a uh, LVL. Next. So as conclusion, the influence of repressed veneer LVL on the strength performance show in table three next and the recommendation for prepress veneer for in future study is uh, more on study on the injured wood product because we know that uh, acacia hybrid is very performed in uh, injured wood product this uh, acacia hybrid locks round is a laminated acacia hybrid unfinished uh, veneer lumber uh, this is one of the potential uh, uses uh, utilization of the AKS hybrid uh, LVL. Next. Uh, and then for the next uh, future research, extension research, yeah, uh, for this one is uh, like uh, image of 10 year old AKS hybrid vessel. And this study was done for fire testing using the AKS hybrid. Maybe we can use this kind of method to study the prepressed linear LVL on the strength performance. Next. Next, so this reference, next, next, and with all that, I'm very thank you to acknowledgement to Ministry of Higher Education in Malaysia for funded this grant, uh, and very thankful to organizer 3rd Euro Acacia Conference 2020, 
and very many thanks to the Sarawak Forestry Department become a host for this year. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Zhang Chan. Uh, sorry to cut off uh, your presentation short. Uh, you have a very uh, comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, it's actually very uh, informative. Uh, due to the time, uh, unfortunately, I have to uh, shorten your presentation. But I hope that we can uh, actually get your presentation. I think a lot of uh, very useful information. So I will reserve the, um, any uh, question or clarifications uh, to the Q&A session. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Damshan, for your presentation. Thank, very thank, very you. thank you. I will now uh, welcome the second uh, invited uh, speaker for this morning. Uh, Mr. Mohammad uh, Saifu Sulaiman. Um, he is from the University College of Technology, Sarawak. Uh, currently, he has uh, actually uh, been an uh, academician in engineering and technology school. Uh, as I have mentioned, that is in the uh, University College of Technology, Sarawak uh, for four years. And he developing developed his teaching uh, and research skill, and also have a, a few research uh, project, uh, mainly in wood science and uh, non wood uh, products. Uh, his research area cover wood science, uh, wood and non wood property, biocomposite and engineering products. Uh, with this brief uh, introduction, I would like to invite Mr. Mohammad Saifu uh, to make your presentation whenever you are ready. Okay, uh, thank you for our moderators, Miss uh, Anything. Uh, so, can you hear me? Yes, clearly. Okay, okay. now let me share uh, for the slide presentations. You have uh, 20 minutes uh, time for your presentation. Okay, All right, thank you. All right, so can you find my slides uh, presentation? Yes. Okay. okay. All right, uh, good morning and assalamu to all of participants of uh, IUFRO conference. Okay, so uh, thank you to the organizer uh, for invitations. I, I am Muhammad Saiful from the uh, University College of Technology Sarawak, Sibu Sarawak. Okay, so today I would like to share uh, parts of our research, a study in acacia species. It's about the experimental investiga uh, investigations on the effects of thermal treatments on the physical and mechanical properties of acacia hybrids. Okay, uh, my slide is it moving? Right, okay. Uh, this is our uh, research outline uh, for that about the objective and uh, some introductions uh, about the acacia space species. Okay, so based on uh, uh, objective and introduction, there are main objective uh, and overview uh, of acacia species uh, uh, properties and their proper performance on wood treatments. And for the materials and methods, Okay, so for the materials and methods, uh, three uh, methods used for identify the physical properties and two main testing conduct uh, in a mechanical properties. And the thermal treatment uh, was applied for the wood uh, durability. And for the result discussions, we will, we will uh, determine the effect of parameters uh, used in uh, research and to the physical and mechanical properties. And on the discussion part, we will discuss the suitability and a performance of acacia properties due to the parameter use, right? And a slide is it the, about our objective. Okay, so we have a three main objective uh, was con conducted uh, with a few parameters are considered. Okay, the first uh, objective is to determine the physical properties on the untreated specimen as a control purpose. And the second one is to investigate the uh, physical properties of a treated uh, specimens based on their difference of uh, portion, temperatures, and durations of uh, thermal treatments. 
And the last one, is it to uh, just justify the mechanical properties of a treated same, uh, specimen according to the parameters uh, decided. Right, uh, so for the introduction part, uh, as I mentioned in a previous slide before, uh, we would like to share a few information about the acacia species, especially on their prospect characteristic uh, treatments, potentials, and also the applications of acacia hybrids. Okay, so the first one is acacia hybrid has a bitter prospect uh, in a larger scale plantations due to the high adaptability to growth in a poor soil with a no adverse uh, effects on the environments. And the uh, second one is it uh, the characteristics of the acacia hybrid. Okay, so the acacia hybrid is process better characteristics compared to the parent species, such as uh, can be uh, in a bigger size in the diameters, a stringers, uh, trans, less branching system, and a less knot on the uh, acacia hybrid itself. And the third one is it the thermal treatments on the acacia hybrid. Okay, so uh, the thermal treatment is a one method used to modify uh, properties of uh, wood by the improving the dim dimensional stability and aggressive to the bio corrosions. And the fourth one is it, uh, the acacia hybrid has a cross missing potentials in a timber industry due to the intensive uh, utilizations of the other gas species and has currently become an, a, a statistical uh, alternative choice for the timber uh, plantation species itself. And of course, uh, due to the investigation on the properties, we are going to the application of the acacia hybrid itself. And the utilization include the furnitures making a purpose a door and a, without a, a window from a frame, bucket floorings and tall components. Also recommended for the engineered wood uh, products such as the LBL, glue lamps, screen balls, and other composite type based on uh, different uh, uh, raw material form. Okay, so. As I discussed in objective part, uh, to realize the potentials and application of acacia, uh, acacia woods, uh, the study was focusing on their physical and mechanical properties due to the effect of the thermal treatments. Okay, so this is a, a few of uh, materials and methods uh, we have done in our uh, part of uh, investigations. Okay, so on the materials and uh, methods part, uh, the acacia hybrid has uh, was investigated by, uh, based on three main parameter use, uh, which is uh, this from uh, portions, is it the bottom, middle, and top, and the different in temperatures of study, is it the, we use uh, two uh, different temperatures, is it 160 degrees Celsius and 200 degrees Celsius, and uh, different in durations of a treatment, which is uh, one hour, two hours, and three hours of a duration for the treatments. Okay, so for the preparation, preparation parts, is it the lock with a diameter uh, breast height at uh, 40 uh, cm will uh, harvested and cut. And in this study, the, the, the trees was harvested at uh, 50 cm from the ground level and 50 cm below the main uh, first main branch and 100 mm of uh, this from the trunk uh, from the three selected portions uh, uh, was uh, taken and for the thermal treatments uh, was conducted using the electric uh, oil curing machine and the palm oil as a heat medium at the different temperatures and durations uh, as i mentioned before uh, then, 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 this, the, then the specimen uh, were cut according to the ISO standard. All right, so uh, as uh, I mentioned uh, before, we have a cover for physical properties and mechanical properties. And in part of uh, physical properties, uh, the study includes uh, for the moisture content, density, and basic density was uh, investigated. And for the moisture content on the acacia hybrid was conduct uh, follow the standard uh, specified in uh, ISO standard. And then the second one is it the density and uh, basic density for the physical properties. Okay, so for the uh, 
density and the basic density the specimen was tested according to the uh, ISO standard and uh, with uh, defined as a density is a mass per unit volume for the uh, solid food matter. And then uh, the other part of our objective is it the mechanical properties. Okay, so on the mechanical mechanical properties a study also focusing on the performance of acacia itself, and this is based on the strength of the uh, static bending and also the compression test. All right, for the static bending uh, from the tangent surface of acacia hybrids was carried out according to the ISO standard as mentioned in on, on the slide and the study was uh, determined the value of MOE and MOR value as a represented uh, the, the, the strength of the modification acacia hybrids based on thermal treatments. All right, so this is uh, as illustrated uh, in uh, four uh, figures uh, on the slide. It was a represent for the, our research conduct in a field until the laboratory test. Okay, so, so for the first uh, and a second figures are indicated for the random sample selected uh, for the acacia hybrids on the field of a study. Then the third figures, uh, I shown the thermal treatment with uh, palm oil as a medium uh, for the curing uh, treatments and the temperatures and durations will uh, monitor using the panel control of the machine itself. And the last figures are highlighted uh, that the sample uh, cutting follow to the IO standards before our testing of uh, physical and mechanical properties are conducted. All right, so. Uh, this is uh, for the results and discussions on the physical properties of acacia hybrids. Okay, so here I would like to share uh, the output of uh, natural of acacia hybrid physical properties uh, and to investigate it on the effect of thermal treatment to the uh, physical properties, uh, especially on the moisture content density and basic density. Right, so this is uh, physical properties of the Hakasia hybrid on the uh, for the untreated sample. Okay, so the untreated samples or a green samples was taken to determine the their uh, properties of the moisture content density and a basic density, and as a controls uh, result to measure the effectiveness of. Uh, <coughs> Sorry, okay. So uh, the figure are represented. Uh, the, the green samples had the ranging uh, at the 65% uh, to the 75% of the moisture content at the different portion of reading as uh, uh, represent on the uh, graph uh, uh, below. And uh, uh, and for the basic density and density highlight the uh, highlighted the, 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 the difference ranging of the value with a basic density was uh, 66, 66 to the to the uh, 72 kilonewton per meter cube and the uh, density showed the range was at uh, 73 to the 76 k, k, kg per meter cube at the bottom middle and top res respectively and found that the high value indicated at the middle portion as a represent in uh, figures uh, show in on the slide, right? And this is uh, the study are focusing on the modifications of physical properties with uh, use uh, uh, palm oil as a, a medium for the thermal treatment on the acacia hybrids. Okay, so based on the main indicators uh, with uh, the wood portion temperatures and durations, the density and moisture contents are determined on the study. And according to the figures shown on the slide, uh, show that the value of moisture content uh, was uh, decreased proportionally the treatment, uh, tre uh, thermal treatment applied with a ranging uh, from 18 to 19 percent of moisture contents, and the depreciation uh, value from 0.5 to 5 percent between each parameter used. Uh, and then uh, for the density. Uh, indicated that the uh, slightly decrease according to the 
uh, thermal treatment apply with a ranging around to the 60, uh, 6 to the 68 kg per meter cube and the highest value of uh, density in orders of all parameters factors are at the bottom portions. Okay, so as you know that the wood density varies great with uh, any species uh, at the tree due to the number of factors such as uh, locations in a tree locations uh, with a range of uh, species site uh, uh, and the site conditions, uh, which is the soil, water, We lost the speaker. Uh, we lost the speaker or? Oh, sorry. Oh, so okay. now you can uh, hear me? I can hear you again, yeah. Oh, okay, sorry. All right, uh, so now, uh, we will discuss about the result and discussions on the mechanical properties of the acacia hybrids. Okay, so this is the third objective, what I mentioned before. This is a sharing part of investigations on the modifications on the mechanical properties for the acacia hybrids. Mr. Uh, Muhammad, would you want to share your slide again? Uh, now uh, we can oh, okay. see your slide. Sorry, it's missing. Thank you. Sona, can you, uh, can you yeah. find my slide? Yeah, can, sharing? See, can see your slide now, yeah. Okay, sorry uh, for the technical problem. Yes, All right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is a part of uh, modifications of the mechanical properties on the acacia hybrids. Okay, so what I mentioned uh, before, we have uh, uh, two main, uh, what call is two main object, uh, two main testing for the mechanical properties. Okay, so the highlight on the figures. Uh, the, the, the two testing has been conducted in a study which is uh, which are the static uh, bending and also the compression test for the static bending the value of MOE and uh, MOR was uh, determined and the rest testing was uh, determined the compressive value of the modifications of acacia hybrid itself okay so let we go one by one for the result on the mechanical properties all right, so uh, the figures uh, highlight that the high value of MOE in a static bending at a bottom portion with uh, uh, around to 9,749 uh, Newton per meter cube for the uh, followed uh, and uh, followed by the uh, top and a middle with respectively uh, value. And the strength of Acacia hybrid was uh, notified uh, that the decrease proportionals the treatment, uh, sorry, sorry, for the thermal treatment was uh, applied. And the clearly uh, represent that on the figures, the value are decreased when the decrease of uh, the temperature from uh, the zero to the 200 degrees Celsius and durations of a treatment at the zero to the three hours. And the, the compar comparison value are indicated uh, in the figures respectively as shown to on, on the slide. And According to the previous uh, research, the strain varies within the uh, amount the species, and they also state that uh, within any species uh, and considers variations uh, exist in a clear root strain, which is a uh, correspond to the variations of density itself. And other part is according to the previous research also that the, the strain varies uh, within. Uh, uh, amount of species uh, and the wood strain, which is uh, correspond to the variations in a density and uh, density strains uh, relationship for the properties. 
and also the, the strength and the elasticity of uh, wood can be influenced by the first several factors such as the density angles of friends uh, present of not on the samples and other and others uh, anatomical uh, features moisture content temperature time and also defect on the sample itself right okay so this is uh, mor uh, value for the static bending. Uh, for the MOR on the slide, uh, show that the value for MOR was investigated for the uh, with the highlighted the uh, uh, highest uh, MOR value at the bottom and above, followed by the uh, top and middle portions. And the, the maximum fiber stress of the Acacia hybrid self. Uh, was determined uh, with a decrease uh, proportionally the thermal uh, treatment was applied in a sample. And the comparison between uh, value of indi indicate on the figures uh, respectively. Uh, support that uh, by the many previous uh, research belief that the decrease in strain properties can be explained by the rates of uh, thermal uh, degradations and uh, losses of uh, substance after the heat treatment. Uh, then the, the decrease in strength is uh, mainly due to the uh, depolymerization uh, rations of the wood polymer itself. And this is the uh, last part on the uh, me mechanical properties itself. Is it the compression test for the acacia hybrids? Okay, so the, the, the mechanical properties of acacia hybrids are determined based on a compression test also and uh, found that the high highest uh, compression value indicated at the bottom with uh, around to the 78 and newton per meter cube and uh, followed by the middles and a uh, top uh, portions uh, respectively uh, ref, uh, respectively and the ultimate strength of the acacia hybrids under the compression test was uh, determined uh, decrease proportionally the treatments uh, to uh, treatment uh, was applied on the sample itself. And the result was uh, show the best ratio for the thermal treatments are at the uh, 200 degrees Celsius and in uh, three hours uh, duration for the treatment itself. And this is a slightly similar with a static bending uh, for the, based on the previous uh, researchers, uh, believe that the compression strain value uh, generally uh, deteriorated with an uh, increase in uh, temperatures or exposed to the time. And against the reductions on the strength of the heat treated uh, samples can be extended with a uh, progressive uh, degradation of the hemicellulose between the macrofibrils on the sample itself. All right, so this is some uh, conclusions uh, can be concluded uh, on the uh, part of our research uh, that means that the thermal treatments will give in more stability uh, to the acacia wood. Okay, so for the treatments, uh, it can be uh, separate into the two, uh, sorry, to four parts. Is it the effect on mechanicals or under the thermal treatments, effect on physical properties under the thermal treatment, uh, the, uh, the, the weakness of the resource and the strength of the resource. Okay, for the mechanical properties under the treatments, uh, uh, the study found that the thermal treatments uh, process did not achieve a desired outcome, such as uh, getting a positive effect on mechanical properties of a treatment on the acacia hybrid. But uh, on the physical properties, the thermal treatment gave a better effect on the physical, uh, physical properties in terms of uh, faster time of uh, wood dryings and high density that can be controlled on the control sample. And the fitness of the study is it that there are a support by the analysis highlights that, that almost of a value strain assessment with a different levels of temperatures and time durations uh, show the lower values compared to the untreated sample itself. But then the strengths of the study is it the factors uh, of a temperature and time durations of the thermal treatments were more influential. To, toward to the physical and mechanical properties of a treat, uh, treated uh, acacia hybrids than the portion of factors. So, so it can be concluded that the thermal treatments uh, were give 
more stability on the acacia woods in terms of a good protective from the uh, dead bark fungi or uh, not easy to absorb uh, the moisture and good for the growing process on the engineered wood manufacturings uh, for the further studies on maybe for the glue lamp, LBLs and other composite uh, uh, product based on acacia hybrids. Uh. Okay, so, right, so I think uh, that's all from me. Thank you uh, to the moderators and the organizer of the conference. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mohama uh, Saifu, uh, for your very relevant uh, research uh, work, again, uh, on the Acacia hybrid. Uh, I will again reserve the questions uh, or clarifications uh, to the question and answer session. Now, I would like to uh, invite the third um, speaker for this morning, uh, Ms. Uh, Yani uh, Joparadi. I hope you have, I pronounced your name correctly. Um, she uh, from, she is now currently uh, attached with Sabah Softworks Rahat and uh, she is holding the position of Research and Development Manager and Managing uh, Research and Development uh, at Softworks Rahat since 23, a very experienced lady and I have been actively translating uh, R&D outcome to operation uh, practices and she has uh, 25 years of research and practical experience in forest plantation, uh, management, and tree improvement, integrating uh, genetics, civic culture, end use property, and forest health in manage managing uh, fast growth tropical tree plantation species in the Malaysian state of Sabah. Um, her presentation will be uh, on uh, the compressing and uh, pastoral property on plantations grown uh, eucalyptus pelita in Borneo, Malaysia, potential for structural and uh, timber and use. Uh, Ms. Uh, Yani, uh, we would like to invite you for your presentation whenever you are ready. And you have, uh, again, uh, 30 minutes for your presentation. I, we can't hear you, uh, Miss Yanni. Uh, you are not milk, but we can't hear you. Maybe you may want to check with your sound system. Hello, uh, can you hear uh, me now? Yes, yes. Uh, can I share my screen? I would like to share my screen first. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, maybe you need to on your slide more. Okay, yeah, good. Can see it now. Okay, so. Um, okay, Assalamualaikum and very good morning to everyone. So happy to see everyone here today. Okay, so my presentation today is actually uh, covers the uh, general overview of the tree plantation as a source of timber for high end utilization uh, based on our evaluation uh, on the mechanical wood properties of uh, plantation grown eucalyptus in uh, eucalyptus palita in Borneo. So uh, I would like to start with an overview, but uh, before that, because I think uh, yesterday, so few presenters uh, talk about the uh, ceratocystis and the impact of ceratocystis on the uh, acacia mangrove plantation. So in Sabah in particular, so we are in the transition of changing the species into eucalyptus palita. So uh, it's also necessitated for us to review the end utilization of the species. 
because the timber industry need wood uh, to process. Uh, is the availability of mixed tropical hardwood uh, logs uh, declined from the natural forest. So it had shifted the supply chain reliance on the natural forest to supply uh, from plantation. So therefore, the timber industry uh, needs to adapt to changes in resource. And the industry itself, uh, they should aware that uh, to supply timber from plantation is relatively complex compared to the natural forest because of the complexity in the plantation management. So, but the logs plant from plantation are more uniform. And that is the advantage. And in terms of vo value, they are lower per tree, but high volume per hectare. So the managing the tree plantation is totally new outlook. And I think the government lead required to foster timber industry based on plantation. And the most important, the, the timber industry people need to communicate with the growers. And what is the characteristic of the new resource? So to produce uh, such a use, uh, it may require single or dual species. And, the timber from a uh, shorter rotation plantation usually have smaller diameter of trees and larger percentage of juvenile woods. And in terms of the wood properties, it's um, uh, the variability occurs within tree spatial and between tree, but even high variation if we are managing a breeding population. So there is a huge variation between family and even within family. Um, and the product quality come from the plantation management is very much influenced by how we manage the state. So it's a, I mean, it's more a complex uh, compared to the, the natural resource. And actually there is a lot of questions, uh, research questions related to this uh, new resource, which is uh, a plantation timber uh, with regards to the solid wood production. And I would like to highlight here some of the fundamental questions that uh, really need in laying the uh, foundation for sustainable and profitable tree plantation, particularly in Borneo. So the growers wanted to know what is the key species to replace natural forest for solid wood product? And what is the key silviculture management? And, and the processor, they wanted to know what is the characteristic of the raw material supply. And uh, we need to quantify uh, and we need to characterize this raw material. They need figures to estimate what capital investment required in retooling the mill or reset up their operation. And the wood product itself. So we need to understand what is the properties of short rotation log and what is the variation in the wood quality. And the most important, I think, the breeders. Uh, to deploy improved planting material with wood quality traits, the breeder wanted to know how can future generation be selected from breeding trials to ensure the best planting material is available for deployment. So to address those questions, uh, our team here in Borneo, uh, the BFC, had initiated uh, this project, uh, which led by Dr. Roger Meader. Uh, and this project involved resource assessment and also uh, the second stage, we have uh, improvement methodology in our uh, breeding selection. But I'm not going to present all the findings for this project, but my presentation today will be focused on this uh, mechanical performance. So what the literature say about the species in the region? So it has been used for pulp dominated, I mean, predominant for pulp and paper in Sumatra as a replacement for acacia mangrove. And some trial been done for, uh, been conducted in Vietnam for furniture. And little or no tree improvement for solid wood and engineered wood product. So in Sabah in particular, in terms of commercial planting, uh, we have started uh, in 2012, actually, I mean, in the commercial scale. And currently we have uh, 16,000 hectares uh, planted uh, on the ground and we have commencing uh, and the pruning have commenced in 2016. 
And this is the first solid wood project being conducted, which is the basis of our uh, BFC, I mean, solid wood project. And uh, further work has been initiated in, is in, as an extension of the, uh, our first solid wood project. And the assessment of eucalyptus palita for mechanical performance is part and partial of the solid wood project in aiming to understand and improve the knowledge base of palita grown in humid tropical environment. And this is our sampling site. And the map shows the Borneo Island contains Malaysian state of Sabah and Sarawak. And all samplings for this study occurred at four sites in Sabah. And you can see from the table there, we have four trial plots being sampled with various ages. And actually we have one, uh, I mean, one study done in, um, in uh, what do you call it, in Sarawak to get uh, some insight before we, we proceed with this more comprehensive project in Sabah. Okay, this is the information of the trial. And uh, this is the sampling strategy uh, that we have set uh, to achieve multiple objectives of the solid wood project. But for this particular uh, wood quality evaluation uh, and for the assessment of the mechanical performance, the samples were prepared along with the sewing study. And from the sewing, so a total of 1,742 boards were prepared with, uh, with that dimension there. And we have 4,800 clear wood test specimen with the respective dimension here for the uh, mechanical testing. And you can see the diagram here shows the uh, schematic random test specimen location from an individual log to allow us to understand the radial variation of the mechanical properties. So uh, all the test specimens were run to failure and MOE, uh, modulus of elasticity, modulus of rupture and compression strength were calculated. And the specimen were tested uh, using the 100 kilonewton universal testing machine, uh, which was manufac manufactured in Taiwan. And the specimen with 20 millimeter width and 60 millimeter length were assessed for compression parallel to the grain. And specimen with 320 millimeter length for three point bending test, which force applied onto tangential phase as plank and radial phase as joist. And you can see the diagram here shows the, uh, the right position of force with respect to grain direction and growth ring of the wood. Uh, this is the result. So we start with the density because we have taken uh, this uh, in each pair of the log section up to 12 meter here. You see on the axis, uh, the X axis here, we have data up to 12 meter. And the density is one of important parameter to guide us on the utilization. And we can see from this graph the mean basic density varies within three and show to be influenced by the tree height here. But interesting here to see that the bottom log, I mean the butt log and the top log is not much different in terms of the density value and uh, tend to increase and plot you towards the crown here actually. And on the other graph, on the second graph, we can see the increase and this is across the, the sampling site just now that I mentioned just now. So we can see increasing trend with age and irregular trend with age of KB one uh, site here due to poor growth performance and actually add, uh, had different establishments. So this plot is actually uh, suffered from high mortality. So, so that's why we can see the irregular trend here. And similar to the mechanical properties here, the three properties, the MOE, uh, MOR and the compression strength, you can see there's almost similar pattern to the density just now across the sampling site. And of course, definitely uh, across ages as well. Yeah. And this is the summary of the mechanical testing data. Uh, the mean value of the mechanical strength from each of the sampling site, and also, uh, I mean, with the respective age here, and you can see the MOR, MOE, MOR, and compression, as well as the basic density. And we compare the mean value with the eucalyptus palita result uh, conducted in Queensland previously uh, on the 15 years old stain. And the result here you can see is uh, comparable with what we obtained. 
And then the mean value also we compare with the acacia mangium on the 16 years old stain. And we found it a bit lower compared to the seven years old stain of eucalyptus colita. And, and definitely for the laran or kalampayan or jabon. So uh, seven years old is a very low, low, uh, is a very light uh, wood, very low properties. And this is uh, more interesting. We compare with the one of the important species, uh, tropical species, uh, which very important for the structural material here. Uh, and we can find, and I presume the this is sample from natural forest. And you can see the the result is also comparable with the older stain uh, from eucalyptus polita. So according to the Malaysian standard. Uh, they have a strength group system, and we found that eucalyptus palita would be classified as strength group two, indicating that plantation grown eucalyptus palita in the tropics has potential for high end use application. So, uh, this is the information in terms of the radial variation of wood stiffness. As we know, that wood stiffness is the elastic properties uh, which measured as MOE and is a very important. Um, properties when we design a product for structural material. And from this, we can see the heat map here showing the MOE uh, of both position from teeth to back. And, and the Y axis here is uh, represent actually the height of the tree. And this is the radial variation of wood stiffness within a single stem. And you can see the value, uh, the color indicate here is the value uh, of the MOE. And, uh, and also the graph on the right side here, and you can see the, the position of the board uh, within the log. So this information shows that stiffness is lowest near the pit in the lower part of the stem and increase radially toward the bug and longitudinally up to the stem. And the implication is uh, the structural are base obtained from the outer wood. And the practical application at the operational level to get the right balance between volume and quality so the operation can segregate vineyard or sawn board for value. And okay, that is on a single stem. So, how the variation look like across the population? So, we see here this is the related board position with respect to P for each of the age. Uh, of the stain, also the sampling side. And we can see from here, uh, stiffness increasing with age and plateaued and never grows to develop optimal rotation period to see the product quality. So of course we see the irregular, again, regular, irregular pattern here for the KB because of some noises. So the stiffness increasing from pit to back and greater magnitude for seven years old. You can see the 150H here is seven years old stain. And you can see the magnitude uh, change very, yeah, very rapid. And uh, stiffness increase from butt log to the top, even though we can see because the color, the line color here is actually represent the log section. So uh, from here, we can see some fluctuation, but the general trend shows that stiffness is increasing from butt log to the top. And actually, this is typical trend of most species being studied by many researchers. But for Polita, even in the juvenile core, are sufficiently high to meet specification for structural. So we can see the nine, uh, the seven years old stain here, the lowest near the P, the, the MOE value is about nine. So what is the implication? So this information will tell that the the, the increase the economic value of eucalyptus palita role of supply from plantation. So the growers can, I mean, uh, we have the value. So the growers can demand for price. So, and of course, uh, uh, we need to enhance the uh, value of the product in order to increase tree plantation profitability. So all the while we are producing a commodity product and for such high value species or high value timber, we need to set for final value so that um, the growers can get better price for the log. So they will ensure the sustainability of the supply from the tree plantation. 
and because the growers is happy because they good they have uh, they get better price from their lot. Okay, so I think our presenter yesterday have talked about injured wood products, so I don't have to talk much on that. But by definition, actually, a uh, majority of the product wood based product that we have in the market are injured wood product, and they are categorized. Uh, under this uh, category. So for the high value, the, the highest value in genius wood product actually can be obtained from this category. And high mechanical performance of eucalyptus palita offers us a real opportunity to add value to the end product. And I think this is some of the example of the uh, ingenious product that has been explained yesterday. So I just uh, click through this slide. So we have blue lamp, this is a long span, yeah. This is the CLT. Uh, so this is a multi-story building uh, using CLT. And this is more sophisticated design using LVL somewhere in the other part of the world. Yeah. And this is another wood engineer, uh, composite engineered wood. And of course, yeah, next. So uh, how was it? Uh, how was the eucalyptus palita characteristic for solid wood application? Uh, so this is some of the finding that we had um, that we uh, found from our peeling study of unpruned material. So this is the um, volume recovery, the total, the range of total volume recovery from the input volume, and this is the volume recovery of the face back uh, veneer from the total input volume, and. Uh, we found that recovery of clear veneer increased with the log diameter. So uh, only core veneer was obtained from seven years old stain due to knots. And there is a significant uh, percentage of loss of value because of the presence of knots from green to dry. And again, end splits were the main contributor to the loss on splitting. Miss uh, Nyani, you have two more minutes. Huh? Okay. For the sowing performance, this is what the recovery that we get. And again, recovery loss on dry grade was due to major defects because of the large branch associated with wider spacing. And then again, end splits is the major uh, contribution. So there is an issue limiting recovery require implementation of CV culture treatment. And there is a critical need to commence a pruning. Why the slide not move? So the occurrence of end splitting, so significant for eucalyptus splita, severity increase with storage time, and there is the influence of uh, sowing pattern. And we also have anecdotal evidence in, in the, uh, uh, some provenance are more prone to end split. And in fact, um, one of the speaker yesterday is supposed to present this information, but what we get from this, uh, and this is the key finding from the study that the end splitting is actually heritable. So based on the evidence that we have here, so I would like to conclude this presentation. So the increasing demand for solid wood products have provided a clear objective for improving the wood quality. And eucalyptus palita is capable of producing high value products such as appearance and structural plywood, flooring, framing, and engineered wood. So managing plantation for high value product will improve profitability per hectare. And we need to review downstream processing to facilitate a small log diameter. Growing eucalyptus palita to produce ingenious wood offers profitable opportunity for individual company and sustainable national timber industry. So we know most uh, of the FMU in Sabah, we may operate more less, less than 20,000 hectares. So in order for them to manage tree plantation uh, economically, they need to produce uh, some kind of high value product for them to be more profitable. So, then wood property issues require appropriate selection of genetic material and improvement in civic culture management. So, increasing stem straightness and decreasing taper are key ingredients to improving lumber or vineyard yield. Uh, for many products, knots need to be limited. The proportion of juvenile wood and compression would need to be limited. So, non destructive methodology is required to deliver wood quality improvement. So before I end, I would like to acknowledge a group of people here. So 
for the Borneo uh, Forestry Cooperative member in particular, and for the Research Center of Sabah Forest Department and Rayat Bajaya for access to material, and Rajang Plywood in Simau Plywood Sendirian Berhad for wood processing, and my colleagues and management of Sabah Softwood, and BFC support scientists, Roger Meader, David Borden, Mike Linkfield, Paul Roberton, Jeremy Broner, and Paul McDonald. And huge thanks to University of Sunshine Coast for the opportunity for the postgraduate. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Ms. Yani, uh, for again, another very uh, informative uh, information on the eucalyptus. Uh, due to the time, uh, we are 20 minutes behind, so I would like to invite the last uh, invited speaker, uh, Dr. Ila Mara. I hope you are online. And briefly introduce him. He is currently serving as a senior lecturer and a course, uh, course uh, coordinator of the mechanical engineering program at the Faculty of Engineering computing and science at uh, Swinburne University uh, at Sarawak uh, campus. Um, his research interest in, involves uh, polymer metric, uh, composite uh, energy and environment sustainability and trauma flux system. And uh, he has actually published uh, more than 50 international journal and more than uh, 18 book chapter and more than uh, 20 conference paper. Uh, very, uh, again, another experienced uh, researcher. Uh, Dr. Ilam Mara, are you online? Doctor, are you online? Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Ilamaran Jayaman, Senior Lecturer, Hello. Faculty of Engineering, Computing and Science, Swinburne University of Technology, Sarawak Campus, Coaching Sarawak, Malaysia. Today, I would like to present a research on development of sustainable biocomposites made of acacia wood for electronics applications. These are my presentation outlines. It consists of introduction, natural fiber composites, flexible energy storage applications, commercial electronics, biomedical applications, novel intrinsically conductive polymers, conclusion and then references. Introduction, primary problem. Traditionally, dielectric materials are made from inorganic substances such as silicon dioxide and mica. These inorganic materials have higher thermal properties Temperature requirements leads to an extreme end of processing temperature and brittle. So, researchers are looking for an alternate material that is polymers. Polymers are gaining wider use as dielectric materials due to easier processing, flexibility, able to tailor made specific use, and better resistance to chemical attack. At the same time, coefficient of, coefficient of thermal expansion is relatively larger than ceramic materials and suitable to atmospheric and hydraulic degradation. These are the drawbacks. At the same time, a weak in mechanical properties. So research is still looking for a new material that is called natural fibers reinforced polymer matrix composites. That synergies property between natural fibers as well as polymer. Basically, currently, a uh, lot of industries, especially electrical and electronic industries uses various kinds of dielectric materials, especially those materials are made of traditional dielectric materials based on silicon dioxide and mica, but these materials consumes a lot of thermal energy. Okay, that is a drawback. At the same time, these materials are brittle. So researchers are gone for polymer matrix materials, polymer materials, polymers are weak in mechanical strength. So currently researchers are working on natural fibers reinforced polymer matrix composites for dielectric materials. Natural fibers of all kinds have been used for various applications. When we can talk about natural fiber, it comes with the different uh, varieties. All the natural fibers are used in various applications. For example, when we can take applications, uh, natural fibers reinforced polymer matrix composites are used in a lot of uh, industries like automobile industries, aeronautical industries, 
biomedical industries, sports industries, and then transport industries, many we can say. One of the applications in which natural fibers have been found useful is dielectric. Currently, uh, electrical and electronic industries, they use a lot of dielectric materials. So, these natural fiber reinforced polymer matrix composites uh, potential candidate for dielectric materials. Dielectric materials serves huge insulations, energy storage, high breakdown materials for transmission and many more applications. Although the use of conventional materials such as ceramic and other substrates as a dielectric has reached a point where facts of sustainability have not properly met. When we can use uh, ceramic, when we can use like uh, mica, when we can use silicon dioxide, various kinds of uh, traditional dielectric materials, they are not sustainable. They reduce a lot of pollution in terms of air pollution, water pollution, as well as soil pollution. So, researchers are looking for biodegradable dielectric materials. That's what the play of natural fibers reinforce biodegradable, that is biopolymers. That is a point of research here. These are uh, natural fiber composites. You can look at uh, natural fiber composites. See, these are various natural fibers, uh, bus fibers, leaf fibers, seed fibers, fruit fibers, and wood fiber. When we can talk about in our research here, acacia wood, because in Swinburne University of Technology, Sarawak campus, we did a dielectric properties testing for various uh, natural fibers as well as wood composite as well. I will show you later on how we did, what are the publications we did based upon uh, wood fibers based dielectric materials. And then grass and reed fibers. These are the matrix polymer because we know composites are a combination of two uh, distinct material. They have a different physical and chemical properties. One is called matrix, that major elements. Another one is called as reinforcement. In our case, we are using reinforcement is wood. For matrix, we use various kinds of plastics like thermoplastic, thermoset, as well as natural rubber. For example, you can look at uh, thermoplastics here, phenolic, epoxy, polyester, polyamide, polyurethane. In case of thermoplastics, we got polypropylene, polyamide, polyethylene, polystyrene, polyvinyl chloride. And then we got uh, natural rubbers like India rubber, modified starch, polylactic, cellulose ester, tannin, and then polyhydroxybutene acid. So these are various matrix as well as these are the various fibers we may use for natural fiber composite. Especially here, we are talking about acacia wood. Acacia wood uh, got a lot of properties compared with uh, other natural fibers, especially cellulose content. The cellulose contents plays an important role in dielectric application. In Swinburne, we are using um, dielectric uh, property testing based upon uh, fabrication. All of our testings are standard based upon American Society for Testing Materials. These are the standard mold we are using. These are hot compression molding machine, and then these are the precision LCR meter to measure dielectric. That is contacting uh, type electrode device to measure dielectric of composite materials. These dielectric properties of composite precision are measured with the HP impedance analyzer. LCR meter is capable of measuring up to frequency of 2 megahertz. The disk sam samples a diameter of 50 mm and a thickness of 5 mm. Diameter 50 mm and thickness of 5 mm. The specimens were analyzed using contacting electrode method. You can look at the picture. This is called contacting electrode mixtures. The diameter is 50 mm and the thickness is 5 mm. Contacting uh, electrode method, which uses a rigid metal electrode. The measurements were done at varying frequencies ranging from 1 kilohertz to 1 megahertz, or we can go for 1 kilohertz to 2 megahertz, also possible. We also follow according to standard measuring device like ASTM D15010 standard for dielectric measurements. As well as we are using standard uh, dimensions for specimen preparation as well. We use either a compression molding machine or we can use a extrusion machine or injection molding machine. In Swinburne, we got extrusion machine as well as a hot compression molding machine. We use hot compression molding machine for most of the thermoplastic polymers to make composite materials. And then we use cold compression in case of other thermoset resins as well. These are the various uh, dielectric materials applications. Um, the sectors like energy storage and conversion, printed electronic circuits, flexible wearable device, power transmission, information storage, and soft robotics. So these dielectric materials are most of the applications in electrical and electronic industries.
Dielectric application of natural fibers reinforced polymer composites. Natural fibers great insulators, which mean that they can able to polarize when they are subjected to high electric field. As it know that there is a multiple polarization process involved such as like any natural fiber got a property of insulator. So they can able to easily polarize. When you can easily polarize, they can able to store the charge. The polarization, different types of polarization takes place, atomic, ionic, spontaneous, phase charge and dipole polarization. So when we can apply electric field on uh, natural fiber, like a cochlear wood, they can get polarized so that they can able to store charges by means of this type of polarizations. Chemical treatments of wood, like alkali, silane, acetylation, peroxide, chlorine, permanganate and steel acid are highly effective in increasing fiber surface roughness and introducing hydrophobicity one way or another so that it can increase the dielectric constant value. Apart from this, other treatments which could give rise to better polarization, especially space charge and interfacial polarization or isocyanide treatment and malination process. This process increases the polar polarization ability of an natural fibers as well. These are natural fibers and their dielectric properties. Uh, it can example like jute, flax, hemp, canaf, loofah, cotton, bamboo, baka, silk, wool. You can look at this point wood. Uh, when we can talk about a wood, generally uh, acacia wood and other natural wood available in Sarawak forestry and the amount of dielectric is 7.1. You can compare with other natural fibers. This is the highest value because of the cellulose content. How natural? Because each and every natural fibers behaviors are different, depends upon their uh, nature of growing. This wood, especially Sarawak wood, uh, acacia wood, it contains 7.1. It's loss factor 0.35 and then relaxation frequency. So from this um, literature, what we know that wood contains high amount of dielectric constant. So this is a potential uh, candidate for preparing electrical and electronic devices made of polymer matrix composite as well. For example, the first application where we can go for um, this type of natural fibers reinforced uh, composites. Uh, this natural fiber, I mean here, it's a wood polymers composites as well. Flexible energy storage device ranges from electronic textiles, artificial electronic skins, military wear and wearable electronics such as smart watches and distributed sensors. These type of flexible energy storage devices uses lot of dielectric materials, especially lot of research going on towards use of conventional material to replace by natural fiber reinforced composite materials. For example, you can look at this Flexible energy storage device at the current research stage are to offer high performance, optimum operation safety and environmental safety. These energy storage devices must possess insulating dielectric layers, which allows moderate levels of shielding and since they became used as human beings. For example, you can see natural fiber reinforced polymer composites comes to play where they are lightweight and optimum dielectric properties allow them to potentially be applied in these application. So what I want to say here, for flexible energy storage applications, natural fibers reinforced composite materials are replacing the conventional dielectric material usage. That's an important thing. And then for commercial electronics, when we can talk about commercial electronics, especially it comes with integrated circuits, batteries and electrical breadboards for all the devices, we are using a lot of dielectric materials. So flexible energy storage device, and commercial electronic device also uses a lot of dielectric materials. However, composite materials are used for ceramic and polymer combinations, which does not permit sustainable material use as not cost effective because the traditional materials are not sustainable. For example, you can take a mica or you can take a silicon dioxide or you can take any kind of ceramics. It consumes a lot of energy during their production. At the same time, they are brittle. At the same time, they are not sustainable. So we need to look for sustainable material. When you can choose natural fibers as well as biodegradable polymer, so it's completely uh, environmental friendly material so that most of the researchers are looking for natural fibers reinforced uh, materials for dielectric. You can look at this point. Recent research has come up with solutions amp up dielectric properties and provide biodegradability at the same time. So they have to satisfy both dielectric property as well as biodegradability.
Currently, these composites are used as insulators, plugs used in household, connectors, cables, and printed circuit boards. So, natural fiber reinforced uh, composites are replacing conventional materials in commercial electronics as well. Biomedical devices. A lot of biomedical application uses uh, natural fiber reinforced composites, especially the technology. You can look at this point. As a new fabrication methods are emerging like fused diffusion modeling, that is fused deposition modeling, FDM. This is a one kind of additive manufacturing or a 3D printing. These technologies are enabled to make different varieties of components. It is easy as well as flexible. Especially these devices are used in biomedicine and then paramedical industries. You can look at this point. Fused deposition modeling is very popular with the polymers as a configuration of FDP fabrications allow and even finish on the product. So we can able to make particular shape and size, even intricate shape, complicated shapes also possible by using this type of 3D printing. Or we can say additive manufacturing. These technologies enables to prepare natural fiber reinforced polymer composites as fabricated to focus on array of medical implants and devices made of assessing bone structures. Even for a bone plate replacement, we are using a lot of bone plates made of commercially um, natural fiber reinforced polymer composites because previously the bone plates are made by using titanium and aluminum and stainless steel. But currently the researchers are doing with a lot of uh, natural fiber composite materials. So these type of 3D printing technologies like additive manufacturing technologies enable to develop a lot of filament. The filament combination of natural fiber and polymers they are used to prepare a lot of composites uh, for dielectric application. You can look at, although fiber reinforced composite materials is a dielectric, it possesses relatively fewer breakdown strength and required further research to fill, fully utilize the niche in which these composites can put into good years. So a lot of research is going on to develop uh, new biomedical devices based upon natural fibers, that is wood-based natural fiber composite as well. Novel intrinsically in the conductive polymers, that is ICPs. Intrinsically conducting polymers are typically a synthetical uh, metal. We can say it's a, actually it's a polymer, it's a synthetical metal. As this possible properties of electrical, magnetic, and optical phenomena, same as metals and semiconductors. These ICPs uh, behaves like a metal, but it contains a lot of electrical and magnetic pro optical properties. That properties are similar to metals and semiconductors. Their application must have low cost, high performance and organic, which can be used in chemical detecting sensors. So this type of ICs are mostly used in chemical detecting sensors because it consists of properties like electrical, magnetic, as well as optical. That property is equivalent to metals and then semiconductors. Also, these dielectric composites reinforced by natural fibers have potential in bioactuators chemical and electrochemical catalyst. So these ICPs are used in various applications, especially for bioactuators, chemical and electrochemical catalyst. The idea here to incorporate natural fibers into polymer matrix to arrange structures. So when we can mix the natural fiber, that is wood with the polymer, we can arrange in a different way with a particular angle, long fiber, short fiber, chopped fiber. So this contributes the various kinds of uh, dielectric phenomena so that it uses in various actuators as well as chemical and electrochemical catalyst as well. My conclusion, from these perspectives of sustainability, eco-friendly and safe matters, natural fibers reinforced polymer composites have a great potential in use as dielectric. Compared with uh, synthetic or traditional materials, these natural fiber composite materials are sustainable, eco-friendly and safe matters. Some of the applications that have been seen here could great examples to prove that advancement of using conventional composites to novel dielectric composites is viable in future and technology driven application. In future, a lot of researchers and scientists are working on replacing traditional dielectric materials by this type of wood based or natural fiber based composite materials. Although one were to critically analyze the exploration of technology for improving the performance and qualities of natural fiber reinforced composite, it requires tremendous efforts and research to move fabricate composite to a finished product. So it needs a lot of uh, research as well as development activities to bring out to the particular shape and then size of this type of dielectric materials. Looking at the commercial point of view, novel composites will always stay an integral part of society 
and the business as time and technology progress. This allows stakeholders like manufacturing industry, commodity cell engineering and research fellows to flourish as there will be a, always be new opportunities when natural fiber or wood-based composites are coming to the market. A recurring challenge to this research community is to make fully biodegradable polymer. That is an important fully biodegradable polymer composites or manufacturing polymer derivatives from bio-based materials. So currently researchers are looking for completely biodegradable polymer matrix composites so that it goes for uh, zero environmental pollution with respect to water, with respect to air, with respect to soil, zero pollution. So that's called biodegradable polymers. Researchers are working on that. Furthermore, there are other facts of material science where natural fiber reinforced polymer composites can diversify their opportunities in additive manufacturing technologies where more challenges lie ahead. So what happened? Currently, there are a lot of uh, techniques like um, additive manufacturing or 3D printing. These are the latest technologies. So these latest technologies also uses various types of uh, natural fibers, uh, reinforced uh, composites, especially we can say with respect to Sarva, a lot of woods are available, uh, acacia wood. So these type of wood based composite materials are plays an important role for the development in future. These are references. These are the publications done by Swinburne University with respect to dielectric materials. Uh, recently in 2021, uh, we published materials, chemistry and physics, interfacial polarization effects on dielectric properties in flux reinforced polypropylene, strontium titanium composite. Um, and then the second publication in the Journal of Applied Polymer Science, characterization study of flux, strontium titanate polypropylene composites for low dielectric application. And then we studied a comparative study of dielectric properties of hybrid natural fiber composites. And then we did the effect of chemical treatment on polarization dielectric properties of kumpong wood reinforced epoxy composites. And then uh, we did, and then we did uh, with the natural uh, Borneo wood like Sarvak wood, dielectric properties of natural Borneo wood like uh, Keranji, Kayumalam and then kumpong we are published in bio researches. These are the various researches um, uh, done in Swinburne University. We are trying to establish, um, to make a complete uh, bio composite materials, especially for dielectric application. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, um, Doctor. Um, now, uh, we are very behind the time. Uh, I think it, uh, less than 10 minutes to the next session. So I will quickly open up to the uh, Q and A uh, session for only uh, five minutes, uh, so that they have some few minutes to start the next session. Um, now uh, from the chat, uh, maybe I will from the chat. There is two questions for uh, Miss uh, Yani. I think that one is quite straightforward. Whether your U, uh, UTM uh, have a testing sample. And uh, another question is from the Doreen Go. Um, she uh, commented that uh, Eucalyptus Falita is very new in Sabah. Um, so whether uh, it's, it, it will be a lot of unknown uh, with regards to this uh, species. So uh, from their observation, there are problems with uh, slip uh, Splitting not poor field performance, and uh, would like to uh, know your comment to this uh, concern, Miss Yani. Thank you, Miss Annie. I think the first question asking about the UTM machine, right? So, yes. Yeah, I think the UTM machine is available for testing, so we can facilitate for those who want to do the testing, so we can provide the service. And then the second question uh, regards to the splitting. Yes, as I mentioned in my presentation just now, that splitting is very significant uh, to Euclectus polita. And I think um, there is an, a lot of, I mean, there is an opportunity to uh, minimize this incidence. So we can set long-term strategy and also the short-term strategy. So the, the, for the long-term strategy, we, so we, from my presentation just now also, there is an opportunity for breeding selection to minimize this incidence. And also, uh, I think for the short-term strategy, and, and this needs to be done at the operational level, because we found that uh, there is an influence of storage time in terms of the incident. So uh, planning at the operational is crucial. 
particularly uh, uh, on the logistic parts when we uh, arrange there, I mean, from the harvesting side to the operation. And at the harvesting operation as well, there is immediate uh, activity that can minimize this way we can put the S hook or, yeah, something like that. And put the, what do you call? At the, uh, the, 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 the end of the, at, at the end of the word, the grease. So, okay, so for the, what, the, the notes, so as a highlight in my presentation, so pruning will help, will minimize the, the notes, and yeah, we will get a clear veneer from the prune trees. And with regard to the poor field performance, I think we need to uh, apply based operational practice. So we already set a, a regime uh, appropriate regime for eucalyptus palita to be more productive. I think that's all. Thank you, uh, Miss Yani. Thank you. Um, the next question is for Mohammad uh, Saifu. Uh, again, uh, thank you for your interesting presentation. Uh, in terms of uh, basic density and moisture uh, meets uh, proportion of tree, is higher than the bottom and top. However, in terms of uh, mechanical property, mid portion is lower uh, except compression. Any further specific justification on this? Okay, uh, thank you for the good question actually. Okay. Uh, so what, uh, what we know uh, with a clear belief by many researchers, uh, uh, mentioned that the the highest density uh, will be highest in a uh, mechanical property itself. Okay, so this is uh, what we, we know before. But then, uh, based on the research, uh, it can be the the result show that the middle portion is uh, highest than uh, density and moisture uh, than the uh, bottom or top, right? Uh, so uh, as we know that the wood density. Okay, so for the wood density and the moisture content uh, will be influenced by a few factors actually. This is such as for the locations in trees, locations uh, with a range of species, site conditions such as uh, soil, waters and slope, and also genetic source itself. But then for the physical and the mechanical, uh, sorry, physical and mechanical properties of the wood itself can be influenced by the porosity of uh, proportions of uh, density itself and also for the organizations of uh, the cell wall structures. Okay, so uh, in this case, uh, for, the, uh, for the for the study, we can look in for the, uh, what call is uh, on the macrostructures analysis. So we can uh, found, uh, find, find that the uh, what what happened uh, on the middle part of the acacia hybrid? Uh, maybe it have uh, the biggest or what we'll call is uh, a West Kola bundle or parakema that influence the, the density itself. Okay, so maybe for the further study, we'll look in for the macro structures on the acacia hybrid. Okay, so thank you. Thank you, uh, Mohammad uh, Saifu. Uh, yeah. Wait, uh, Mr. Uh, Jamshan, you want to make a comment? Yes, I'm coming on the, the difference value of the compression by basal portion, medium, and middle and top. Actually, for testing or study in, involved uh, solid wood specimen, they, they must be emphasize or more particular about the hardwood and sapwood must be isolated. They will not mix. Together, mm -hmm. that's why the the, the there's more be variation in future study. Yeah, that's my comment. Yeah, all right. Uh, all right. That's all. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Jamsa, uh, for further uh, clarify the uh, the point. Uh, with uh, this, I fortunately I need to end this uh, question and answer uh, session uh, because it's only one minute uh, to the next session. Uh, thanks. Uh, the invited uh, speaker for this morning, four of them, uh, for very interesting uh, presentation. And uh, 
with this, I would like to pass back this session to the MC. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, just a note to thank you, Miss Annie, for your excellent job on facilitating these sessions. As always, you were impressively well prepared and extremely professional in the way you keep us all at the height of our attention throughout the session pretty late in the afternoon yesterday and this early morning as well. Thank you as well to all the presenters for these sessions, Dr. Jansah Mokta, Dr. Muhammad Saiful, and dear friend of mine from Sabah, Madam Yani Japarudin, as well Dr. Alamaran Jayamani. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, before moving on to the next sessions on genetic and breeding, let me briefly introduce the moderator for this sessions. Associate Professor Dr. Ong Ken Huat have been with University Putra Malaysia, Bintulu Campus, Sarawak, for the past 18 years at the Department of Forestry, Faculty of Agriculture. Cultural Science and Forestry, University of Putra, Malaysia. His in research interests include forest restorations, silviculture, and tree growth and yield. Please let us welcome Dr. Ong Ken Huat. Um, thank you very much, um, our MC for this morning. Uh, welcome to the conference again. Uh, I was informed actually this morning I will be actually uh, moderating or the session chair for five speaker. Uh, can I actually change a little bit the uh, the way the con uh, this uh, session will be run? Right after the presentation of each uh, presenter, I will actually uh, invite uh, the uh, audience to post questions or directly raise hand and ask questions. Then it will be faster and it will not accumulate until the end of the session at the noon time. Then uh, if uh, any of the um, presenter have to leave early because of the time difference between uh, Malaysia and other countries, then it's easy for them. So um, again, I would like to remind all the presenter, although it's uh, limited, uh, allocated 20 minutes, but with the introduction of yourself by me and also uh, the technical uh, difficulty probably will uh, face. So can you limit your presentation to 15 minutes? I will remind you uh, when the time comes, three minutes before the end of your presentation so that you can write up your presentation early. So the first, um, Presenter will actually Dr. R. I. Arif uh, Misak Manto uh, from Indonesia. is currently is a senior re researcher at the Center of Forest Biotechnology and Tree Improvement. He was born in East Java in, in 1968. Um, doing a lot of research on uh, tree uh, breeding, especially Acacia and Eucalyptus. 1994 until today. Uh, he got his master's and degree of tree genetic and breeding from Kyoto University of Japan in 2002 and 2005, respectively. I published a lot of uh, peer reviewed uh, papers in different journals. Um, until today, uh, until today, he already achieved eight registered variety and four granted variety of plant protection variety for acacia and eucalyptus species. Um, active in many international collaboration projects. Uh, recently, he got uh, award from innovative, uh, innovation award from the Ministry of Environment and Forestry uh, Indonesia for the innovative researcher category in 19, sorry, 2019. Uh, this morning, his paper will be on the genetic and breeding of tropical acacia in Indonesia. Uh, he will share about the challenges and the challenges the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Hello? 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 Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. But it's echo. Somebody is actually open to... No, I would like to share my my my, my presentation. Okay, can we start? Okay, can we start? Okay. 
Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And yeah, it is an honor for me to be one of the speakers. Are you speaker. open to uh, two devices at one time? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. The one device for, for the backup only. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, that's okay? Uh, no, okay. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And it is an honor for me to be one of the speakers in this EFRO conference. And uh, again, I would like to thank also for the organizing committee for inviting me as a speaker in this uh, uh, conference. Yeah, actually, I will already send a video for this uh, presentation just for pick up in case uh, I have problem or technical issue during my presentation. Okay. Uh, yeah, the topic that I would like to talk today is about the genetic and breeding of tropical acacia in Indonesia, the nose of challenge and a redesigning of breeding strategy. And uh, before I uh, talk or start to talk, I would like to emphasize that uh, the most of topic that I would like to present today is uh, uh, coming from our experience during uh, more than 25 years in breeding of uh, genetic and breeding of acacia. Uh, practiced by Center of Forest Biotechnology uh, in Indonesia. And yeah, uh, this is the outline of our presentation. Yes, I would like to uh, briefly introduce the Acacia species in Indonesia and the role of genetic and breeding uh, on the productivity of Acacia and the challenges of genetic and breeding for sustainability of Acacia plantation and the approach in redesigning of genetic and breeding for acacias, and uh, our proposed uh, redesigning breeding strategy, and some additional information about the improved stand in the invasiveness issue, and finally, the conclusion. Okay, this is uh, the brief of the reduction of acacia species in Indonesia. Then there are three, three uh, species that have been widely planted in Indonesia. Acacia mangium, Acacia fragicarpa, and Acacia uniformis. It is for, for the three main side products, pulp and paper, sound timber, and biomass. And the species and site regime for this plantation is mostly in the dry land, about uh, more than 65%. It's dominated by mangium uh, plantation and small area for Acacia uniformis. But for the peatland area, fully dominated by the Acacia fragicarpa. And you can see in this map, it is uh, historically of uh, introducing acacia species in Indonesia. It's coming from natural institution in eastern part of Indonesia, like Papua, Papua New Guinea, and also northern part of Queensland, Australia, that introduced uh, plantation in the western part of Indonesia, including Sumatra Islands, Kalimantan Islands, and Java Islands. But recently, there are also some plantations as we have in Papua Island. And from the beginning of our genetic and breeding practice, we already explore and use more than 1,000 individual seed lots covering the post species of acacia. And this is the, the genetic improvement framework for acacia species uh, practiced by CFBDI. And mostly we function to the breeding population establishment, such as progeny trial, hybridization, and clonalysis, which is supported by many various activities, like molecular marker, disease resistant, issue culture, the property, and many other uh, activities. And this is, just for example, our target of improvement for the acacia, for PAL. And we would like to improve the growth and also the property to achieve the wood consumption about 3.5 to 4 meter cubic woods to producing one tower pal. And this is the existing breeding strategy applied in, in uh, Indonesia and also in most of the breeding system for Acacia. That basically, we use recurrence lesson system that, uh, by using supplying system management. And we have uh, set up about a five to uh, four to five supplying for the Acacia. And from this breeding system, some evidence and improved growth productivity has been realized. Uh, based on provenance base, uh, about the 20% of improvement, and also for seed orchard base across the three generations of breeding, there's uh, average about a five to 10% improvement per generation. 
And also we already developed the interspecific hybridization between uh, Acacia mentium and Acacia coliformis, which is promising productivity. There's uh, about 70% overall than the, our second generation Acacia mentium. And uh, as introduction by the chairman, that uh, this year, the government in Indonesia has granted a plant protection priority for our uh, Acacia hybrids. And this is the successive improvement from the breeding from the first generation to the third uh, generation that uh, we improve the single seam in the fifth generation and, and uh, we add some uh, good strikeness from the second generation. And uh, we also add some the high good density in the third generation. It takes about two to 12, uh, breeding, uh, 12 years breeding process to complete such, this successive of improvement. But only breeding selection could be potentially applied to shorter uh, to make a sort of the breeding process. And a constant to the decreasing of genetic resources for my acacia, there's, uh, we try establishing mixed generation breeding population. It's quite promising because uh, we get some information from this trial about the growth is the founders family coming from F0 is not always poor as compared to those from F1 and F2 generation. And some of them uh, showing more productive in, in some case. And we already calculated in the final of selection that 15% of the top 20 families rank is coming from the founders family. And you can see in this chart, uh, of our, so we, we refer as a third generation plus, and you can see the growth from one year, two years, three years, and four years. And uh, from this trial also, we try to, to get connectivity between the growth and good property. There's a improving growth and form trait that has been practiced in the first and second generation, provided a better good density than an improved one. But the successive improvement on BPH from F1 to F2 generation has reduced the relative increase of good density by more than 50%. It should be must be concerned for, 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 for on this uh, uh, good property. So uh, changing the selection criteria for our next group uh, of breeding population is necessary by incorporating good density and a broader genetic diversity in further successive generation of breeding. And to validation of our improvement, we already established a genetic gain trial and several trials. And we can get some information from, from this trial that uh, about uh, genetic environment interaction. For example, as it reported in many studies, that family by site interaction is significant for ICSMAU. But in this trial, we verified that in the seed source level, seed source by site interaction is not significant. It means that the, the deployment of seed can be about uh, wild. And the other observation is about the connectivity between the intensity of selection that has impressed this during the breeding to the tree span density. And we get uh, some result that. Uh, Improved seed that has been produced from low intensity of selection was less tolerant to the less tolerant to the intertree intertree competition. But improved seed that has been produced from the high intensity of selection seed orchard is more tolerant to the inter intertree uh, competition. And you can see in this uh, uh, chart. And in case of acacia reforms, yes. Uh, now we enter with the second duration of breeding and improvement uh, is a little bit lower than, than the Acacia mangium, that about uh, four to six percent of genetic gain. And, but in the second generation breeding, concerned on the sound timber's purpose test, we try to put some additional observation in the breeding population to access the family by three density interaction. And you can see that the very uh, density we tested in this uh, breeding population. And uh, for Acacia hybridization, the Acacia hybrid with Dimensium and Acacia reformis, that uh, we already improved the growth that I mentioned just before, but the 70% was higher than our second generation Mangium. But we also observe about the potential of our property. There's uh, uh, some of clones that we already tested. The good consumption is around 3.5 to 4 meter cubic good for cotton pulp. Not only pulp property, but we also already understood about the potential dissolving pulp property, that the aquasia hybrid has good potential for dissolving pulp property. And one important point for this aquasia hybridization is 
related on the both property, but the male and female effect on the two species. For example, if we use mangium as a male, so it tend to dominate the fiber dimension of the acacia. I think this is quite uh, the information to, to make uh, some uh, a crossing between the mangium and acacia form. And for acacia ricarpa, it is more similar than acacia uniformis that uh, estimated genetic gain in second generation is around uh, 4%, 5%. But another attention from this acacia ricarpa is how to optimize the side breeding testing and side plantation regime. I mean, that's a breeding practice will be uh, established in the dry land, but improved seed in Indonesia will be used for peatland. So it is a kind of a thing uh, to be uh, uh, considered for, for acacia classical breeding. And this is the challenges of genetic and breeding to the sustainability of acacia plantation. And we note some uh, challenges. First, for example, the pest indices, as I've been uh, presenting by the uh, uh, center yesterday also, that's uh, particularly for serotexis attack. And, uh, during the five, the last five years, under the Asia project, we already uh, got uh, a tolerant stock of acacia mangium to uh, stratocystis. And you can see in this picture, uh, it is not only tolerant, but it's also showing a uh, sort of superior growth. That is quite a good uh, uh, challenge, uh, chance for, for us to, to use this clone to be uh, further deployed. But one more important point that we challenge is that maybe there is a genetic by isolates interaction. Because we, CFDTI, already share the same genetic material to three partner companies to be inoculated by their own uh, isolates. But as a result, there is an inconsistent of the uh, genetic for, for the tolerance for those that are I think this is a good challenge. For, for, for the next program, yes. we have to deploy the tolerance uh, clone and to be uh, comprehensively uh, inoculated by uh, the partner by using various of isolation. And another challenge is about the site regime, is particularly from the, the cycle of rotation harvesting. And in the peatland, from the groundwater level, that the new regulation. Now the groundwater level about the 40 centimeter. It's quite difficult for Cassicarpa to be to be uh, grows well, and also the changing of climate change. Because now we 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 also that uh, the the very and the, that's big problem from the flowering of our acacia, uh, maybe due to the climate change, less uh, like uh, less abundant of flower and less random mating that opposed from the apportion of seeds and the seed production must reduce recently. And also changes in the industrial manufacturing and like a green industry, circulating, uh, circulating and of a volume to value perspective that need for us for improving good property and power property decide to grow. And the important also uh, big challenge is the, about the natural genetic resources. Because so we, 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 we have uh, calculated that genetic resources for Acacia has decreased and decreased continuous in this. But at the same time, we have diverse of trade to be genetically improved because we have many, many challenges and problems. And the last thing about the evasiveness issue, I think sometimes it's also become a problem for, for acacia planting. And this is the approach of in the redesign of genetic and breeding for acacias. We will uh, note some justification for this approach. The first one is about the limitation of genetic resources, but the high and diverse and challenging phase now. And the limitation in uh, genetic resources due to the forest fragmented, especially on the natural distribution, is quite difficult now to get uh, 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 genetic resources for Acacia. And another one is uh, an effective experimental design in the breeding population dealing with uh, saving genetic resources. And uh, another, the impact of various of genetic and environment interaction also. And some adverse for correlation among the growth, the property, and end product. And com compromising among the survival rate, length of rotation, stand growth, good property, and manufacturing end product. And this is some evidence that we've uh, found in, during the, the, the breeding that genetic and environmental interaction should be translated on the, the genetic level and family 
high by side uh, interaction for hair. The significant for hair, yeah. and significant also for family by three density for crude hair. And this is our new finding that there is a significant family by generation of breathing interaction for the crude hair. And you can see in this uh, chart that uh, this is the effect of breathing shifting uh, orchard uh, that we uh, adopted now. There's uh, the spacing is uh, changes from the beginning to the final family selection. In the family selection, the spacing is much larger. As a result, uh, improved seed can be uh, maybe less productive if you plant it in the, the real spacing of plantation, you know, very, very narrow plant, uh, spacing. And another important point is reducing of genetic resources. As I mentioned just before, the important point is the breeding seeding seed orchard. This three function for progenic chasing for seed orchard or genetic base, but the critical activities in this breeding seed orchard are about the selection and thinning. And according to our uh, experience, there's more than 75 genetic resources lost during the thinning and removing uh, aspected genotypes. I think this uh, seems to be a drawback of the uh, breeding seeding orchard seed. And how to solve this? Uh, yes? I think three more minutes. Okay, okay, okay. I would like to speed up. This is our proposed uh, breeding strategy. That's we propose the breeding population with no thinning to keep the sustainability of all genetic material uh, used in this uh, breeding population. And you can see in this uh, table, this uh, comparison between the, our proposed uh, strategy using seedling seed orchard base and the existing comparison uh, breeding seedling orchard base. And you can see that in the breeding CS of base, BSO base, progeny trial is the first priority. Then after thinning converts to the uh, uh, seed orchard. But in our proposed strategy, as SO base, the first priority is seed orchard establishment. That can be used to get information for progeny testing. But no thinning is an important point. There is no thinning for, for, for our proposed concept. And this is some merits of the proposed strategy. And it's a double layer of progeny trial. It means there's connectivity between the grandparent and the grandchild. And also assessing based on the real, the realized performance rather than predicted one. The possibility in the experimental design, more simple in population management, more applicable in the case of a different uh, between the breeding testing and uh, site of plantation, and also saving more genetic material and more genetic gain for the trial. And to support this uh, SSO based uh, our, our purpose strategy, we use a single tree plot configuration rather than uh, multiple tree plot. It is the flexibility of single uh, three plot configuration that we can reach a post plotting and we can get accurate genetic uh, parameter, less thinning, and also evident, efficient in use of genetic material. More selected trees, more seed production, and more saving genetic material. And we already simulated about the comparison between single three plot and multi three plot. And the result that single three plot can get 25 to 30 uh, percent, uh, percent in gain more than the multiple triple. And this is our, our, our last uh, of proposed strategy that to support the SS of this, we use the recycled genetic resources. We, we call it a mixed generation breeding population. So we can use, recall again, our grand uh, uh, founders families. And what support, to, to support this, uh, the, the recycled genetic resources, we have to keep the, the uh, pay delicate control to reduce the inbreeding incident. And it is uh, our uh, issue, uh, another topic that's uh, improved stand productivity related to the invasive nature. The point is that genetic inbreeding can, can, can limit the invasive nature because uh, we can improve the growth. By improving the growth, so we can have first thing more earlier before reproductive phase uh, appear. Another one, we can use uh, management and spacing, neuro spacing to all the canopy closure for increasing implicit, implicit and uh, also some video. And this is our conclusion. Uh, in the past, the genetic and breeding practice have provided a significant role in the increased fan productivity for acacia plantation. However, the productivity would be meaningless due to current serious shift dealing with pest and disease effect and some uh, limitation of the environment, such as wetland regime and the changes of um, perspective and manufacturing of in product as well. And the release of genetic resources combined with an effective breeding strategy will become one of the key solutions for overcoming the such challenges of I guess medium. Last, 
thought in a redesigning of living strategy for as necessary to put be that could be approached through uh, conservancy breeding selection by considering of breeding with no thinning, assessing the realize of perf progeny performance rather than the predicted one from the parent performance, and optimizing the available genetic material with an effective experimental design for stimulating seed productivity. I think that's awesome. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for keeping to the time, uh, Arif. Uh, there is one question from Iko Hadi Yanto in the uh, chat. Um, in the chat, lack of infection rate of serotosis uh, in the validation trial in Central Java for resistant clone selected in nursery, perhaps due to longer dry season in the region. What do you think? Okay. I, I, I will repeat the lack of infection rates of characteristic in the validation trial in Central Java for Eastern clone selected in the state that have mutual language. Yes, no, uh, yeah. Uh, our our, our, our uh, stand in tolerant, from, from tolerant clone in Java is not for validation. Validation has been practiced in the, in the uh, Sumatra Island, in the real of uh, 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 plantation. What we also uh, established in, in Central Java is just for clone bank. We collected uh, so many uh, clone tolerant in the clone bank for further use. So validation has been practiced in the real of plantation, not in Central Java. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the answer. Uh, there is the second question. Are you... Uh, are uh, you have conclusion if we uh, plant another acacia at one, sorry, uh, uh, yeah, from Budiman. I'm not too sure uh, what is the question. At one peta, uh, as for example, acacia agricultoris and Cassicapa uh, result from seed. I'm not too sure what is the I you have conclusion if we plan another acacia at one beta, I'll uh, I, I, I could understand this, this question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand the question. <laughs> okay, anyway, we move to the third question. I allow okay, the last yeah, yeah. one this uh, one for Professor Winnisar. Sorry. What yeah. are the emotional challenges to your redesigning breeding strategy? Okay, thank you, Prof. Vicky. Yes, uh, actually, our purpose uh, uh, breeding strategy, we already established some trial in, 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 in our uh, research station. So that's why we have uh, uh, such kind of purpose breeding strategy. This breeding should be more conservative, not as uh, Commonly applied, adopted today by the breeding seeded orchard and doing some uh, thinning and some uh, uh, removing the aspiration time. This is because in the advanced series in breeding, thinning is almost not necessary in our breeding population. This is our observation. Because in the advanced series in breeding, variation between family is smaller and smaller. In the one plot, Multiple three plot, sometimes we observe that almost similar performance. But if you say breeding seed and orchard, we have to remove another tree because we have to retain only one tree, the best one. So, based on this uh, uh, observation that uh, uh, we proposed, that actually the current out of the tree can be improved for more conservancy because genetic resources are very important for. Uh, 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 yeah, for well, challenges of a future problem, maybe. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Prof. Thank you very much, Arif, for yeah. the more um, very informative uh, presentation. Yeah. So now we move to the second uh, presenter, uh, Dr. Nguyen. Uh, let me uh, read his uh, this one uh, CV first. It's from uh, Dr. Nguyen Duke. Kin is from Vietnam, uh, currently based uh, as um, currently is uh, a position is a director of the Institute of Forest 
tree improvement and biotechnology. So um, he's obtained his uh, UST degree uh, in forestry in 1997, master in, of biology in 2002, PhD in biology from Swedish Institute of Agricultural Sciences in 2009. He have 24 years of working experience in forest genetic and tree breeding. Uh, much of the work have been dedicated to genetic improvement of fast growing tree species, uh, domestications of native tree species and deployment of improved genetic material to commercial uh, plantation. Uh, he currently also the leader for Acacia Genetic Improvement Program in Vietnam, uh, also involved in supervising a number of master and PhD students in Vietnam and uh, work as a consultant for forest companies in Vietnam and other countries in Southeast Asia. Uh, this presentation today is entitled Recent Advancements in Acacia Breeding and Deployment for Wood Production. Without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Nguyen Dukin to present his uh, presentation. Please, Dr. I, uh, we can't hear you. You are uh, you mute. You are mute. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yes. You can hear me. Ah, no. Yes. Yes. Please. Yes. Can you see my slide? Yes. Yeah. We can. Please continue. Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 So thank you, Mr. Chairman, the organizing committee to invite me as a invited speaker to this uh, conference. So the topic of my uh, talk today is a recent advance in Akasa breeding and deployment for wood production. And I present it on behalf of my colleagues who work in Akasa breeding in the last five years with me. So the point we will cover in this um, talk is uh, first about some information about few species breeding, hybrid breeding, polyploid breeding, and some work on uh, breeding for protosis tolerance, some work on molecular genetics, and some comment on future research. Before going to uh, talk on, on breeding, I would like to give you some background of acacia in uh, Vietnam. So acacia plantation in Vietnam is now about two million, more than 2 million hectares, mainly uh, planted in the north and the central coast of Vietnam. And uh, this constituted by many three species, Acacia Mangzoom, Acacia Hybrid, between the Mangzoom and Auriculiformis, and Acacia Auriculiformis. And uh, half of the plantation is managed by small farmers, and, uh, but most of the, the Acacia genetic improvement in Vietnam is mainly performed by Vietnamese Academy of Forest Sciences in 1990. So the volume has been the main, the most important selection criterion in our breeding program uh, because the farmers mostly sell the wood on the, based on the standing volume basis. On the cheap mill, they also buy the wood at mill gate on green farm basis. And the store mill, they buy the wood in, on the, the gate. They grade the wood in by diameter. Regarding the our few species breeding, so the method the, the, the method we are using now is recurrent selection for germ combining ability in open pollinated breeding population. So while we started with the uh, proveni giant of around 100 families from known best provenance in uh, Papua New Guinea and Australia, and within within that. Uh, the uh, proveni child within to remove the whole family and inferior tree within the remaining family. So we collect the we select the best tree from family wood family 
to collect the seed for next cycle breeding. And we are now under the third breeding cycle of the own tree species. And because we are going to advance generation, so maintaining the pedigree information is very important to minimize the level of related needs. So in our institute, we already set up the pedigree recording system for our main planting species. So we can check on the pedigree from the third generation back, back to the first generation so we can minimize the level of related needs in the, our population. So according to our study, we uh, found that the most of our chests are under moderate to high heritability, where the food the basic density has a higher density, a higher heritability compared to growth and or uh, disease tolerant character. So our breeding program, we have greatly improved the volume for production, but also we improved the uh, stem form and branch form of uh, our acacia. Especially, we can, if we can see in the picture, where you can find that uh, our acacia brascapa and selected clone of our recombinant has very good, very chest span and small branch. Regarding acacia hybrid, so in Vietnam has been successful with acacia hybrid breeding, where we have um, we started the acacia hybrid breeding in uh, about nearly 30 years ago. And up to now, we already selected about 20 clones approved, but among 10 of them are uh, used uh, widely. And most of the hybrid we are using now is from nature and hybrid. And we are using the tissue culture planted, uh, plant that initiated from auxiliary bark from young sapling to be used as a head for cutting propagation. And that's why we can maintain the juvenility of the very old select from clone selected uh, by more than 20 years ago, but still maintain the stability and growth. And with the development of uh, techno tissue culture uh, technology, now people also start using the tissue culture plant directly for plantation. We have we are employing the four uh, selection and breeding methods for acacia hybrid. From the beginning, we started with selection of acacia hybrid from plantation or from progeny child. In the second generation, we started with the uh, set up the hybridizing orchard where we planted the wood clone of acacia manzoom and acacia origin from it in the hybridizing orchard and we collect the seed and from in the seed we sow in nursery and we select the hybrid uh, seedling based on the morphology character. We also work on control pollination and the new method we are now, we are start applying with the synthetic population, breeding population. So, as we start going to the advanced generation of hybrid, we found that we, have, we can increase the growth of the newly selected clone of Acacia hybrid. It's better than, they are better than the previously selected clone. In, uh, so we can, we can increase the uh, growth rate of newly, uh, new Acacia hybrid now. The control pollination is uh, we are not it's not the main method of uh, breeding. Water that uh, is genetics, yeah. But uh, we add and we use it as an amendment to putative hybrid because and we found that the reciprocal effects are not so important, and we can because. Because if we let the own the the, 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 the species, some uh, in the population, some parents, some parents, some parent species could, some parent sheep could not contribute to the hybrid population. So control population can be used uh, to construct as an option to increase the pet and disease tolerance 
And also control question is very essential for polyploid breathing. So in the last five years, in the last nearly about six, we started our polyploid breathing since you know, nearly 20 years ago. And in the last five years, we have achieved some great uh, success in chiploid breathing pro program where we have selected uh, some very good uh, uh, clone of Acacia, chiploid Acacia hybrid, where the cross is between the tetraploid Acacia mangum and uh, diploid auriculiformis, and we found that we can increase the growth rate, but also we can increase the fiber length and reduce its fertility. So we can see here, the, we have compared the two, the fiber length of two Acacia, chiploid Acacia hybrid, and the two, the fiber length of two Acacia of diploid hybrid, Acacia hybrid. And we can see that the, the fiber length of the chiploid is significantly longer than the uh, diploid. And also the chiploid, when we expect that when we have the chip ploy, we expect that we can the chip ploy would, would not produce any flower, but it's not. The chip ploy still produces flower, but the pollen viability is very poor or no germination at all, and we can collect only collected the seeds uh, from only one clone of the on chip ploy clone compared with very low success with the, the high apostle rate. And when we sow the seed of cheap loin in the nursery, we found that the, the growth rate of the, of the progeny is very inferior compared to the deep loin uh, seedling. And most of the tree could not survive in the field for up to six months. And serotosis, uh, similar to uh, other countries, the serotosis is now becoming uh, important in uh, Vietnam. So we also work on the improving the uh, serotosis tolerance. So we have uh, in, performed some inoculation trial in uh, Acacia uh, auriculicomid and Acacia hybrid to select the uh, to rank the clone for serotonin attack, and we found that there is significant difference between clone in uh, DZ index, where we can then in this trial we already selected some clone that are highly tolerant, and we planted them in the field, and we hope in the next few years we can uh, find uh, some clone that having a high health uh, tolerance in the field. We also realized that the um, Acacia auriculiformis is uh, very good, uh, the is the tolerated species. So we want to use them in the, as a parent in hybrid breeding. So we already uh, inoculated uh, 85 uh, family in the nursery. And we uh, estimate, the, we measure the listen length in the percent of token high from uh, two to four weeks after inoculation. And we found that the very big, large variation between family, then, then we, are, we can select the family of uh, high tolerance for the next for breeding uh, purpose, especially in hybrid breeding. We also have some performed some uh, work on the genome uh, genomic breeding. In the last year, we started with a, a population of 400 clones of Acacia hybrid, and we uh, used uh, genome-wide uh, scanning, so, and we already select determined few, few SNPs that are highly associated with diameter and height in Acacia hybrid. And similarly, we, already, we also have determined some uh, SNPs that are highly correlated with um, uh, 
uh, very tolerant in a caste hybrid. But we can we, uh, understand that we can, we, for, for this, uh, for gen genomic breeding, we will not use them directly for selecting a best tree or best glow, best, best tree for, but we are using them to screen in the nursery and also to reduce the number of clones in the testing site. So we, the testing is very important. Uh, so this one, this uh, method, can be used as an amendment to increase the uh, efficiency of the selection process. So regarding the future research, as we are, as Arif also mentioned, that we lost of the genetic variation in, uh, in advanced generation. So we have to increase the genetic diversity, especially it is very important in the age of the disease uh, emerging. So, but we also have to minimize the level of resistiveness in breeding, advanced breeding population. And I believe that the genome sequencing of some main species will be very important uh, for facilities like Acacia Mangzum and Acacia Smith that to provide a better understanding for future research for example, the genome editing. So, but this requires a lot of funding, but and also the international cooperation. We also have to work on novel polyploid, so we can create some uh, polyploid to change the proportion of uh, parental species. So we can understand to enhance the size adaptation and also DC resistance of the chiploid and also work with advanced generation hybrid. So we have, we have been done a good job in uh, creating the wood clone uh, for planting, but deliver the best germ plasm to small grower. We have, we have not done the, uh, the, the job, not very, we are not very satisfied, satisfied with, uh, with this because in the um, commercial plantation, so a lot of farmers, they still use the plant. Uh, the Excuse seed. me, Dr. Uh, Dr. Nguyen. Excuse yes. me, Dr. Nguyen. We yes. have another two minutes to finish presentation. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. So a lot of farmers still use the uh, acacia mangum from plantation. So this, this reduces the productivity. Also, the small nursery, they are maintaining the cloning health for a longer time because we only we set up that we can um, use that cloning health for three years and have to change to the new uh, cloning health from uh, using the tissue conscious plant, but they still use for five, seven years. So that also reduces the seedling, the cutting quality. And ceiling price of improved stuff also remain a big issue because the loss of it, it costs a lot. And supply of new and improved germplasm also very limited now. So this all this uh, uh, problem, this requires a collective effort of breeder, government support, and policy commerce industry and farmer are needed. We need all this to work to overcome this uh, issue. So on this occasion, I would like to thank my Acacia breeding collaborators, especially though in Vietnamese Academy of Forest Sciences, the scientists in uh, CSIRO from in Australia and University of Tasmania who have been working quite very closely with us in uh, our work. And what we thank Asia for longer support for nearly 30 years support in Acacia breeding and with CSIRO for lots of support in the last 25 years. And also I thank the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development of Vietnam for supporting us in the, those nearly 30 years. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Nguyen. Uh, the presentation is very informative, just like Arif. Uh, uh, both presentation complement each other, uh, sharing different uh, experience in Indonesia and Vietnam. There is a question for you. Is it possible planting acacia in big pot, not in a field, to make it 
uh, made a control pollination easier uh, in the uh, question and answer chat. The question is, is it possible planting acacia in big pot? Is, but uh, not in a field to make the uh, control pollination easier. Can you answer that, Dr. Nguyen? Uh, yes, we have started. We already started some cricket on the clone bank in the like we call mobile seat or chat. But it doesn't work. Uh, it doesn't work. It worked with the uh, eucalyptus, but we found out that it doesn't work with uh, acacia. So, but I believe that technically we can we can uh, do that. But uh, I haven't seen any successful example in uh, Vietnam or in other countries. Maybe some my some of my colleagues in uh, Indonesia or Malaysia can have some comment, but I, we haven't, uh, it was not successful in our case. Okay, thank you very much, I mean, uh, Dr. Nguyen. Any qu more questions uh, for our colleague, uh, our presenter from Vietnam? Uh, Dukin, any questions? Uh, if no, thank you very much, Dr. Nguyen for your uh, presentation. Now we move to the, to the third presenter for today, for this session. Uh, the third presenter will be, oh, Dr. Jeremy Bruner, Browner, sorry. Uh, he's from the uh, United States of America, currently uh, held the position of assistant professor. Uh, He's uh, currently based in the uh, Department of Plant Pathology, uh, University of Florida, since 2019, with the responsibility in research and extension on tree health genetic resources. His research program is focused on developing disease tolerant tree crops, and the extension program delivers this variety to a wide range of uh, stakeholders. He worked with forest and tree crop manager in Florida and abroad to develop uh, re uh, resistant uh, breed of trees. His presentation title will be on uh, breeding resistant, resilient, sorry, resilient trees. Uh, without further ado, uh, uh, Jeremy, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, can you see my screen? Is that okay? Yes, yes. Okay, great. <clears throat> um, yeah, thank you. Uh, it's nice to see a lot of old friends and um, hear about the progress that's being made. Um, great to hear Arif and Ken's talks just then. Excellent work from both of them. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to talk today about developing resilient forests. Um, things are changing. Um, not sure why the, there it is. Um, so developing resilient forests, um, developing for me is about um, improving productivity of um, forests and how they can help regional economies. And um, research for development is part of that, trying to not only increase the productivity of large companies, land holdings, but smallholders and um, improving livelihoods is an important goal for me. So resilience and our ability to adapt to uh, climate change and pest and diseases, that's basically the, um, the heart of the talk today. Um, we're talking about cooperation and its importance and um, then moving into some changing environments and pest and disease threats. So cooperation, um, fairly key part to doing what we're doing nowadays dealing with um, new pests and diseases as they come into the forest and just dealing with climate as it changes and um, different environments that we're interacting as we expand plantation resources. We can cooperate and pool our resources to be more cost-effective and efficient, um, create more capable people and um, expand how much information we can pull out of the trials that we can, we can establish. So. Cooperation through our sharing of resources really can enhance the ability to develop resilient forests. And 
when you pull together big groups of people, we can we can prove the value of cooperation. Um, hundreds of dollars for a hectare of uh, resistant slash pine. Um, long time ago, that was an estimate that a large cooperative cooperative effort was able to make, um, and was part of my early master's work. So, understanding the significance of disease resistance and resilience that can be done with cooperative efforts, but very difficult to do by yourself in isolation. So cooperation, um, <clears throat> the public sector, the um, sort of communist approach and the corporates and the capitalist approach, they're both excellent and they both achieve gains. And um, I think it's much better when we merge them and we put them together into partnerships. So that provides the best of both worlds. And a lot of times that's facilitated by placing cooperative structures inside of academia. There's lots of university-based um, cooperatives that go way back in this part of the world here in Florida and all across the US and other areas. But um, nonprofit organizations such as the Borneo Forestry Cooperative or Tree Breeding Australia came for those are becoming more common and people are working together to um, develop uh, resilient plantations. So one of the reasons um, cooperation is so important Arif was talking about the erosion of genetic resources. If you're one group trying to manage genetic resources and you're thinning and pushing for productivity, it's much harder to maintain all of your genetic resources. Whereas if you're cooperating with a large group of people, different trials will bring different families to the top and we can have larger pools of genetic diversity that aren't eroded as quickly as we did with the rest of our commercial crops that are now, um, yeah, extremely non-diverse after lots of generations. We still have the large diverse gene pools with our forest trees and I think cooperation will help us keep it that way. So an example of cooperation with CAMCOR, some work we did collaboratively with CSIRO, looking at trials across the world. They had a huge network, lots of people and companies working together. And once we have that network, we can pull data together from lots of trials with lots of environments and all the environmental data underneath and use our information from one individual local trial to infer how things work across the planet. So for example, changing productivity across the site or temperature or water availability, different species, different families will change and how they react to that um, environmental change. So you can look at one variable at a time or part of my work has been trying to visualize how this all happens at once. So for eucalyptus, you can start to, or for this CAMCOR pine trial, I'm sorry, you can start to see which populations um, that they planted around the world are responding to which um, environmental variables. And environmental variables are classified um, by the way that the uh, different species are reacting. So you can put it all into one, one visualization, understand whether or not there's responsive or non-responsive, adaptive, non-adaptive populations how similar they are in their response to the environmental variables, how they cluster, how they group, which ones are similar and how they respond to change in temperature or rainfall. And the important thing here is not what any population is doing, it's how cooperation is what makes this possible. When you work together with lots of in the different trials, you can experience lots of different environments. Then we can start to understand how different populations should be pushed across the landscape to improve productivity or to make more resilient populations. And again, this works, it's not just pine trees, it's wheat, eucalypts, anything where you have large cooperative trial networks, you can start to understand how different temperature, rainfall, and the environmental variables work. And then we can start looking across species and understanding the basic physiological principles that underpin that. Um, a lot of this was done um, while back trying to understand the genetic regulation of physiology, water stress specifically, a tool we were trying to build to understand when we could deploy eucalypts from nurseries. Um, and uh, on the way along, we were able to predict photosynthetic rate and other functional traits of eucalyptus and use that to predict um, their, these physiological traits and seedlings that we were able to drought and, um, experience abiotic stress and use that to identify genetic parameters and down at a plant level, understand the physiology of how it changes. Then we'll have lots of genetic parameters that would not be um, 
very informative if they weren't pulled together from large populations. So understanding how things respond to hydration and wilts and how the different physiological attributes are changing, what the genetic regulation is, um, something that's, that's interesting and useful for understanding how to respond to change in the environment as it's happening. Um, we can start to see where there's stable families where photosynthesis doesn't change, it just continues through droughts, either when they crash, when there's photosynthetic responses to water availability. Um, changes in the amount of genetic variation and when you can start to select for response to um, drought. Although we have this information on little populations, again, without cooperation to put it out in the landscape and to put it into a forest and to understand how it reacts on a planet. We, we don't have much information. We understand seedling reactions, but understanding how it changes as we move across into different environments. The important thing is to have trials. So large trial networks, such as what's been established in Borneo um, over the past decade or so. Um, lots of native species, lots of exotic species, and lots of trials. Um, similar trials going across Sarawak with a similar group of people. So. Um, Hopefully within the region where you are now, we can have some other options that are available for the industry. Um, Yanni spoke about the trials that we planted, one of the first networks, pelletal progeny trials. Really, really good examples of people pulling together information from large amount of families, genetic diversity established across many sites to identify populations that are going to increase the productivity, exactly what Ken was talking about focusing on volume and trying to produce more wood for people to produce better products. Out of this work, um, genetic resources that were established led to a PhD completion, Yanni's excellent presentation earlier today, characterizing wood properties. Um, yeah, all stems from this really well-designed cooperative progeny trial network. It was designed with eucalyptus pelleted in mind. Um, yeah, in cooperation, you can expand from um, one organization to another, completely disconnected breeding populations using some molecular markers or DNA work, such as what Ken was talking about. An alternative way to use that is to provide connectivity across disconnected populations. Um, being able to pull together information from Malaysia and Laos and Vietnam in the single prediction models, and then using some statistics with the models and the rest of the um, statistics to bring together the pedigree information that Ken was talking about as such as an important role, pulling that together with the marker data. And so combining bits of marker data with the whole pedigree to infer relationships across the population. So something that was done um, in Southeast Asia with lots of different organizations and moving from pedigree to markers, we we're then able to move from one population to another so a couple of trials in Laos um, connecting up to trials in Malaysia and Vietnam are possible once we um, have markers across the parents and some of the individuals within the populations. Then it's able to infer how things will do in different regions. And if some program in Malaysia, for example, has an issue that can rely on what is in Vietnam and the resources that are available there and work out how to um, collaborate with Kin and um, people in other countries to bring up the um, diversity back in the populations or to identify individuals that are more responsive to certain environmental variables. So you can start to see where there's correlations that are really great in some cases, some pairs of trials in similar environments and pretty average in other ones. But um, understanding those correlations and responses between trials that were completely disconnected in the past lets us understand what we will gain or lose when we start to move new populations and new environments. So a lot of this is covered in some recent stuff, work that we've done with Eucalypse in Australia. But um, I think the focus in Southeast Asia of putting together some of these amazing genetic resources that we have um, should be a nice way to collaborate cooperatively on um, tree improvement. So in summary, um, trial networks are required. Cooperation is key to making those trial networks come together. Yes, have to have diversity across those trials and um, really have to understand the environments well. 
So understanding that physiological plasticity and how things respond at a plant level and scaling it up to stands and regions in the states, um, I think that'll be one way that we can respond to the change in the environment that we're seeing now. So working together with other people to connect these collaborative trial networks um, will let us uh, respond more rapidly when change occurs. So yes, this requires cooperation. So moving on from um, responding to environmental changes, responding to a um, biotic challenges. So stratocystis, for example, running through and destroying all the uh, acacia plantations that we worked so hard to develop. Um, yeah, the response was plant eucalypts. It's a great species, not a problem, but in Brazil, ceratocystis is a large problem in um, eucalyptus and rust has been discovered in wet tropics and sometimes eucalyptus just dies. So not, sh not, not sure exactly what the perfect answer is, but again, genetic diversity, you can start to clone things like this. When you have major outbreaks, if you have diversity, something, something will be able to come through. That's what we've been seeing with some of the screening that's been done in different places in Southeast Asia in response to ceratocystis and other diseases that have raised their heads. So the initial work of getting everything together from an old ACR trial, all the genetic diversity we could find in Sabah and screening and understanding protocols and large trees um, was a, a great initial start. And um, it led to a, uh, amazing collaboration with Fabi and um, the uh, folks in Saba Softwoods and the Borneo Forestry Cooperative, which I think is going to lead in time to some more resilient breeds um, of acacia. So while we can find trees, they are rare, but they do exist. And um, it takes a lot of a lot of screening and a lot of effort to identify them. Um, luckily, we had the expertise of um, Mike Wingfield and his excellent presentation the other day about how exactly we should be moving forward with this was um, was great to hear there's progress. Um, so within some work we we're doing to try and short circuit the ceratocystis system and race ahead to clone something quickly, um, screening young seedlings to find something we could rapidly propagate. Um, yeah, it wasn't really successful because of the time lags involved in developing enough cuttings of each one to recapture those clones to get them back out into the landscape at scale. But it did provide a, um, a, a screening of some sorts that identified some material that has now been centralized in um, CFBTI and Pacanto and Arif's um, programs. And now there is, there is some material that is able to um, withstand uh, natural and inoculation and pressure in, um, in Sumatra. So it's, um, well, it's not a perfect system in any means. It's, um, it has been able to identify some material with huge amounts of effort. Um, I think the um, effort that also went in collaborated and coordinated with Vietnam as part of the um, ACR project was great. Some of the learnings we brought from each other was amazing. Um, able to work across Vietnam and Indonesia at the same time with experts, um, different species and bringing the resources together was excellent. Trying to understand the accuracy, what we're losing by going to less and less direct measurements of canker growth in large trees, phylos to seedlings to saplings to field trials. I think it's been done really well in um, Vietnam and understanding what we're, what we're not capturing by looking at seedlings, we're looking only in the field. There's um, great comparisons here. Um, a lot of germplasm has come back and forth between Indonesia and Vietnam to try and um, bring both the program's uh, germplasm resources back up. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been a great experience between the two, um, two organizations and working towards larger field trials for full validation, which has been a great idea. Excuse me, Jeremy. You have yes. another one, uh, two minutes to complete your presentation. Perfect. So yeah, just um, part of the biotic, responding to bi biotic threats, um, disease resistance is important and it has been integrated into many different programs. I think it's, it's been really refreshing to see disease resistance breeding coming in um, to all the programs as part of a risk management strategy. So um, yeah, other people have talked about it. 
much um, more eloquently than I have, but basically I think it's um, responding by having genetic diversity, accurate phenotyping systems and an ability to go through large populations. I think that's the one way to respond to um, disease incursions. And the systems we've put together, in the, well, I think it's the team and the people. They're well placed to um, solve some of these problems. So yeah, cooperation, it's important. Um, think alternatively and um, look, on, look beyond your estate boundaries, understand what's coming at you and what, how you can respond. Genomic connectivity is a benefit and can be used to increase the range of environments you can look through. And um, yeah, diseases are a problem and they're gonna keep coming. So having these teams of people that are trained to deal with them is excellent. So it's important to maintain the genetic diversity so we can increase selection intensity and work together to develop resilient breeds. So thank you very much. Um, and uh, I'll leave the time for any questions. Thank you for the uh, very uh, informative presentation and highlight that actually to do research, we have to have collaborative uh, work around the world if to achieve better results. Uh, there is a question uh, from uh, Mr. Vicky. Ideally, the, and realistically, how many resistant or tolerant clones will be required at any one time in designated areas? Uh, well, it depends on how we deploy those clones. Um, I think Vietnam's gotten away with some really amazing clones, few clones for a long time. Um, if we're deploying the clone, the seed from those clones, um, it's going to take a while till we can have that back on the landscape at scale. Um, so yeah, if we had you know, something coming through a system like Dr. Kin's tissue culture system, um, I'd be comfortable with 20 because we'd lose some, but yeah, there's no magic number. A hundred would be great, but man, that's going to be hard to do. So um, yeah, 10, agree with you. 20. Uh, the second question from Doringo. Do you foresee that uh, Eucalyptus palita will be the better species than Acacia in the long run from economy and pest disease perspective? Um, I'm not sure. I think like Chris Harwood said, we need both. Um, which one's better depends on the site. Uh, Eucalyptus pellita currently is um, surviving well. Acacia mangium is not the hybrids. Um, if we had consistent propagation systems like the ones you have during um, tissue culture to get them out where they're not physiologically aged, I think the hybrids are the future for acacias and they will have a great place. But until we can prove they're resistant to ceratocystis, I, the, yeah, difficulty seeing how they go on scale. Okay, any more questions from uh, to Jeremy? Uh, you uh, joined us from US, is it? Good. Yeah, yes, I did. <laughs> I think you uh, right. uh, Midnight, just. <laughs> Thank you for taking us from US. Uh, any question? Uh, any more questions? Uh, if no, thank you very much, Jeremy. We move to the uh, next speaker, uh, Dr. Rogers Arno. Uh, he is currently holding position as uh, associate research scientist and also head of silviculture R and D uh, at the China Ecology. Uh, research center, uh, Chinese Academy of Forestry, and also Stora and Su Quanzi Forestry. He grew up in Australia, studied forestry as an undergraduate in Australia, then as a postgraduate master and PhD in USA. Uh, he has worked in New Zealand, US, Chile, Australia, Sri Lanka, Malaysia, and China with project experience in several other Southeast Asia countries. Uh, from the mid 1990s, he worked as a research scientist with CSR, Australia's seat, <coughs> three seat center for 12 years based in Canberra, Australia in 
in 2006, he moved to China to work with April, uh, Forestry China, up to 2009, when he joined uh, the China Academy of Forestry and uh, with the China Ecological Research Center in Xinjiang, Guangdong province. In this year, he moved to Beihai, Guangxi province and joined Sora and so Guangxi Forestry to lead their R&D program on eucalyptus and acacia. Over the past six years, he also worked as part-time for Samling Company in Sarawak, Malaysia, advising them on R&D and plantation street culture. Without further ado, the floor is still up, Rogers. Oh, many thanks. It's really great to be able to participate. Um, yeah, here we go. So, oh, the title is uh, A Tale of Two Genera, Exotic Acacia and Eucalyptus Species in China. Sorry for that. Yeah, that's all right. So, hopefully, you can now see my screen okay. Yeah, uh, yep. we can. Okay. So, I'm going to talk about the very interesting story of the, well, the content, the history, really, the history of eucalyptus and acacia introduction and domestication here in China. And, really the R&D and other factors, how this came about, and then leading into more recent developments, what's happening here and a view to the future of both species. And you know, it continues to unfold and be a fascinating story. And eucalypts have been arrived here in China well over 100 years now, it was in the late 1800s when they were introduced really as amenity trees. And then they were planted in various applications, but it wasn't until around the mid 1900s, around 1950s, that the first serious plantation started. And all the early plantations were based on seed. The photo in the middle on the right, you can see, is very typical what plantations, early plantations, look like. But after a lot of R&D, the first clonal plantations were actually established in the 1980s, and once people saw the superiority of going to hybrids and clones by the early 2000s, really most of the commercial plantations were then using hybrid clonal stock. And then by 2020, the total area of eucalypt plantations had increased to over 5 million. Uh, sorry, Roger. Can yeah. you uh, share your slide again? Share again. Okay. Yeah. Because your 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 slide is actually hang, I think I think you have to reach uh, share again. Okay, try again. How was that? Oh, now it's frozen on me. Oh yes, it's okay. Yes. Okay. So, yes. So now I'll go to the next one on acacias. Acacias have a similar history to that here in China, of eucalypts here in China, rather. The first Australian acacias or exotic acacias, truly exotic, were introduced in about 1930s. And they were soon being planted for fuel wood and then realized the potential to get tannins from Acacia mernsii or black wattle. And also from auriculiformis became very popular here of planting by roads and around villages and houses, mainly for fuel wood and shade and protection. And then in the late 1980s, early 1900s, Acacia mernsii, the black wattle, was promoted and people were very optimistic about its potential for producing tannin from the bark as well as fuel wood and pulp wood. And then with increasing interest in producing more pulp, there was also a lot of interest in the 1990s and early 2000s in acacias for producing these as tropical acacias, acacia mangium, acacia auriculiformis, and acacia crassicarpa for producing pulp wood in large plantations. And then some of the big international pulp and paper companies started planting acacias as well as eucalypts. But then in 2008, you know, the interesting events occurred. There was a very big cold snap here in southern China that damaged a lot of existing acacia plantations. 
and coinciding with this was the emergence of the veneer industry. This is, I'll go into this a bit more, but basically and countless veneer mills started buying eucalypt, small size eucalypt logs to fuel for veneer and they weren't interested in acacia. And I'll show you why in a minute. And so the interest in acacias has waned very much over the last 10, 20 years, but just in the last couple of years, there is now a lot of interest, very strong interest in planting acacia melanoxylum or blackwood for its high quality timber. And looking at the actual R&D effort that has sustained this development of both genera. So there was a lot of investment in R&D by China and Australia. This was under yeah, collaborative R&D development systems work. And there are a number of big, well, primarily ACR supported collaborative projects between Australia and China. But for each of these projects, the Chinese government, they enabled institutes in China to leverage that investment and also get a lot of more investment from the Chinese government. So the R&D was really well supported. And Australia very generously provided a lot of seed lots, research seed lots, more than 2,000 seed lots of over 100 taxa of acacia to include in trials and breeding programs here. And there was a very big area of acacia trials planted across southern China, a big network, including both tropical as well as some of the well, subtropical temperate acacias. And you can see here on the right now, this is a five-year-old stand of acacia melanopsin, looking quite impressive what they've achieved by doing a bit of clonal selection with acacia melanopsin. Now the effort on eucalypts was very similar, really starting from 1978. There were more than 16 collaborative Chinese Australian projects, major projects on breeding and silviculture and wood, wood properties. And again, very substantial Chinese investment over this period on R&D and domestication of eucalypts. And Australia provided thousands and thousands of research seed lots to go into these in various trials and breeding populations. And that has provided a fantastic base up to today where China is really very well endowed with eucalypt breeding populations and genetic diversity in their breeding populations of many species. And you can see the transformation from their early plantations to nice hybrid clonal plantations has been quite spectacular. And in eucalypts, not only the visual appearance, but the transformation in productivity, especially during the 1990s, they went from these old seed-based plantations of maybe inappropriate species, but when they went to hybrid clones, as well as improved fertilizer practice, it led to a very marked increase in productivity. And then since then, there have been increases in productivity, but also, I suppose the variation in productivity, which is not shown here, has also increased. And it must be stated that even over recent years, you know, the ongoing success really has been very fortunate. The Chinese government has been very supportive of forestry R&D. And this is going to research institutes and universities to enable them to continue their work. So very good basis for the R&D. And the outcome of all these efforts to date, you can see on the left, eucalypt plantations have increased very quickly in the last 15, 20 years, now up to 5.4 million hectares. You know, really a major resource and a major industry depended on this. And acacias, it's much harder to get data on acacia plantations, hence the scatter of data points, because they don't, they're not very well counted in the National Forest Resource Inventory. But it has certainly seemed to have declined over the last 10 years or so, with an exception of maybe the last two or three years, because people, they've lost out for various reasons, which I'll go into in a minute. <clears throat> and just to show you where this substantial resource of eucalypts is, so I'm based in Guangxi, dark green down the bottom, and Guangxi has 
almost half of China's eucalypt plantation. So it's a real center for plantation eucalypts and the industries processing the wood that they get from them. And also some of the other coastal plantations, Guangdong, Fujian, on Hainan have substantial areas as well as inland Yunnan. And the factors that have helped led to this increase in eucalypt plantations really have been that there has been huge demand for wood by the Chinese economy of all species, of all genera. So you can see in this graph that domestic production, while China produces a lot of wood, it's nowhere near enough. And the total imports are much greater than the domestic production. So more than half of China's wood requirements relies on imports. So any log you produce in China can find a ready market. But as well as the demand for wood fueling the growth in eucalypt plantations, there has also been reasonably good state policy. The government has been encouraging development of plantations and plantation industries. Now, I've already mentioned that there has been very good scientific support with very good funding to state R&D institutions and universities for doing R&D. And most importantly, has been very good prices for the logs, eucalypt logs coming out of plantations. And <clears throat> up till about 2005, the main market for eucalypt logs really was pulpwood. China had quite a significant export market or exported a lot of eucalypt wood chips to Korea, to Japan, primarily. And it was seen as a very good revenue source and really a very good market for eucalypt growers. And this provided some market pull. But then beyond 2005, the same logs became highly sought after to produce veneer. These are logs as small as six centimetres. Without changing the silver culture or the species, these mills started buying up what was previously pulpwood and they started paying much higher prices than those producing export wood chips would pay. And as you can see here, so small diameter logs started fetching very high prices in local veneer mills, which sprung up across the countryside. By some estimates, there are map now more than 20,000 small veneer mills just producing air-dried veneer scattered across southern China and particularly here in Guangxi. And this created a huge market pool for plantation growers because you could grow eucalypts here on a five or six year rotation if you can deliver them to a local veneer mill and get over 100 US dollars for many of the logs per cubic meter. But the same veneer mills are not interested in acacia logs. And the reason for this is their inferior stem straightening. And just to provide an insight on this market for veneer logs, it is almost, well, it has almost been insatiable. And this is because the increased production and demand for plywood. <clears throat> so this shows the increase in engineered wood boards, most of which is plywood over the last, well, over the time period from 1999 up to 2015. So in 2015, China produced 290 million cubic meters of wood panels or wood engineered boards. And that has increased further. It's now well over 300 million cubic meters per year. <clears throat> and a lot of this production has been fueled by China's enormous construction boom that if you go past any construction project in China, you will see mountains of formwork fly or construction fly in use at these sites because the primary method of construction in China here is concrete formwork. And this has created a huge demand for construction grade fly. <clears throat> but in all this, that's created a challenge for acacia because typical acacia plantations, which have been established here with either moderately or unimproved stock essentially, 
have poor stem straightness. And the only value for logs from these is for basically pulpwood or for MDF feeds. So their main market is really pulpwood. They've also suffered problems in coastal China with typhoons, the tropical acacias. We have very high frequency of typhoons in this area. Eucalypts and certainly some selected eucalypt plants have much better tolerance. Now, as soon as you go inland away from where you get typhoons, then they're subject to occasional cold and frost. Now, even though that is not insurmountable, it's been a deterrent to some growers and has been a real deterrent to them. And the big factor really limiting in case is also has been very limited availability of improved planting stock. At present in China, with the exception of now Acacia melanoxylum, there are no proven selected clones and there is no seed orchard seed available. Despite the prior R&D efforts, things got dropped and forgotten about. And unfortunately, the domestication and seed orchard programs that were, let, were really let lapse and deteriorate to the point where we don't have improved stock available. So looking to the future, <clears throat> well, here in China, people, you know, I always say my colleagues are very optimistic and I think generally they have good reasons to be. This graph on the left shows the wood supply, again, from domestic and imported wood. And as you can see, with imported wood, more than 100 million cubic meters of wood has to be imported into China every year. So if you can increase your plantation area and or productivity, there is ready market here for every bog you can produce. And recently on the right, there is also very big optimism about the market for certain types of pulp and particularly paper board products. On the, this shows the planned expansion of pulp capacity in, in China. As you can see in Guangxi, some companies are very optimistic planting, planning over 10 million, like to 14 million cubic, 14 million tons per year of pulp capacity. This is what is planned and some of it is already under construction. So as well as a very big market for veneer logs, there's going to be an increasing market for pulp wood from all sources. Excuse me, Roger. You have one more minute. Yep. Yeah. 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 I've just about finished. So there's a need, but there's a problem with the case is we need to increase the diversity and start producing improved material because a number of companies, Dorenso, APP, have to plant some areas of acacia for various reasons, which I'll expand. But one of the big interests at the moment is really in acacia melanoxylum or the acacias. And you can see on the right, some very nice furniture made from 10 year old acacia melanoxylum grown. And there are now improved clones of acacia melanoxylum available for purchase here. And that has been transformational. And, but we still need to increase in China in general, the investment in providing improved acacias. And that is now happening, I think. And just to wrap up, so there's a lot of information, a lot of detail about all this. And this really is just a very brief summary of two journal papers, myself and co-authors have published on this subject last year in the International Journal of Forestry or the International Forestry Review. And anyone wanting more information, I can recommend either of these, well, both of these papers. They both provide really interesting perspective. Yes, and with that, I'd just like to finish and say many thanks to Sarawak Forestry for organizing this excellent conference. Even though we can't meet in person, it's still great to be able to share information and see many old friends. Thank you very much, Roger, for the uh, very informative uh, presentation. Uh, any questions uh, from the audience? If none, actually, I will ask to ask one question. What do you foresee for the acacia species in China? The perspective of it, since that, uh, although research has been done for numbers of years, but 
now they, their performance is not so good. Yes. I, I think they have a very bright future as complements to Eucalypt. Because here in China, many companies have an obligation to plant some of their estate with non-Eucalypts. Oh. So 20% for story. And so we have to have 20% of our estate in species other than Eucalyptus. And the best alternative to Eucalyptus for many reasons is Acacia. And so, yes, there's really big demand. And there's, for various other reasons, there are other people interested in planting melanoxin or blackwood to produce high quality timber. Yeah. So I think Acacias will have an increasing role and be increasingly important so long as we can provide people with improved planting stock. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question for Enya uh, at the chat. Uh, you have been working in flower as well. What do you see the prospect of eucalyptus here in Sarawak? Uh, well, the prospect is very, I think the prospect is very bright, but it still needs a lot more R&D, you know, a very sustained effort. So we have really highly, you know, good improved material and we understand the silver culture better because the challenge in Sarawak is a very high rainfall, which leads to very prolific weed growth, we have to be able to control the weeds and we have to really understand our, the fertilizer requirement. But get it right, that was the big thing in China that led to improved productivity. It was both a combination of improved silver culture and improved germplasm together. And that work was done back in the 1980s and has been ongoing since then. But yeah, it was a key to having those two together, not just focusing on genetics, or silver culture. I have to go hand in hand. Okay, uh, any more questions from uh, audience? If none, thank you very much, Roger, for very informative presentations. That I, I, I believe that there will be more questions uh, probably at the chat. Probably later you can chat and also reply yeah. to them. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Uh, we move to the final presenter this, uh, uh, not morning, no, it's noon time. Actually, uh, from India, Dr. Mahashwal, uh, Maheshwal Hash is currently based in the Eric Forest Research Institute, Jaipur, Rajasthan, India, uh, as uh, working as a scientist. So previously, he worked as uh, at the Institute of Forest Genetic and Tree Breeding. Uh, for 20 years before moving to the current institution, uh, institution which is Eric Forest Research Institute. Uh, during the last 23 years, uh, he has been working on genetic improvement of various forestry species uh, and also developed first and second generation seed orchard for Acacia aricaiformis and Acacia mingit. So far, he has been published a lot of research articles uh, in the International Journal and also called the, a few books. So without uh, further ado, uh, uh, Dr. Hesh, uh, the floor is yeah. yours. Yeah. Good morning, good morning to everybody. Uh, thank you for a nice introduction. Uh, excuse me, yeah. Yeah, my slides are not clearly visible. Yes, yes. Please. Yeah. yeah. One minute. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my topic is uh, variation in growth traits and wood density among 14-year-old uh, Acacia Mangium Harsip family, families. This work was carried out when I was there in the Institute of Forest Genetics and Tree Breeding at Coimbatore. At the outset, I thank the organizers for uh, this conference, the Forest Department of Sarawak, Malaysia and Infro, for giving me an opportunity to present this work uh, in front of August audience of the international research community. The next slide, please. Yeah. The 
Acacia mangium, of course, it is the uh, fastest, uh, one of the fastest growing species among the tropical tree species native to Australia, Papua New Guinea, and Indonesia. But it was introduced to India in the early 1980s uh, by one Archbishop Gregorius of Trivandrum. He brought a few seeds from maybe Australia and planted in his backyard. By seeing the, the fast growth, people got attracted and farmers started growing it. And there was a huge demand for the seeds during 1990s. From this limited introduction, the mangion spread to the uh, farmland. They started growing in the, uh, as a pure crop as well as uh, along with the other crops also. And there was a lot of interest among the farmers. But uh, later, uh, this result, uh, the, those, that kind of interest is not there among the farmers due to various reasons. Coming to the use of the Sarcasia mangium, in other countries it is being used for paper, fuel wood, building, for furniture, and also particle boards. But in India, it is uh, being used only for pulp wood, currently at uh, six to seven years rotation, by mostly by paper mills, the forest government uh, departments, forest development corporations, and uh, forest departments in high rainfall areas, especially Kerala, Karnataka, and northeastern states. Uh, these two states, Western Ghat and other northeastern states. And uh, the early introduction was uh, uh, sourced from very few, uh, maybe few trees, maybe one or two trees. And uh, it was the early uh, cultivation was from these few introductions, but later. The government agencies like uh, institutes like KFRI, then Mysore Paper Mill started the Brownlands trials. And instead of forest genetics and tree breeding, Coimbatore also started a comprehensive tree improvement program of this mangium during 1997. They received uh, some 80 families, seed lots from the ATSC Australia, CSIRO, uh, with the assistance of World Bank uh, project funding. and. Uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, the, it is used as the base population and it was uh, converted into SSO and seeds uh, started supplying from this uh, uh, trials. Next one. Next, next slide, please. Uh, the coming to the Acacia mangium planting region, it is not planted uh, throughout India and uh, it is planted in the Western Ghat region, especially the West Coast and the uh, uh, hill areas of Western Ghat up to Maharashtra. And one more reason is the Middle East, that is the uh, Orissa, West Bengal, Bihar, so part of Bihar and part of Madhya Pradesh, that is the central region, and the, the northeastern region. These regions, uh, they receive more than 1,000 mm rainfall, and uh, maybe soil also is suited to the, uh, the cultivation of acacia mangium. Mostly these are the states, Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Maharashtra, Orissa, Jharkhand. These are the states where these Australian acacias are being grown, but as such, acacia mangium is grown only in Kerala, Karnataka, Orissa, and also some northeastern region. Uh, in other region, uh, the maybe the soil is may, soil may not be suited, and the rainfall is low, dry region, so it is not suited to acacias. Uh, but uh, in some parts of Tamil Nadu, that is the east coast, acacia arikili farmist is being grown, but not acacia mangium, and even Gujarat also. Uh, on the western side, but uh, acacia mangium is not grown because maybe the soil is not suited and also the uh, low rainfall areas. Next one, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. This, uh, the seed lot supplied by the uh, ATSC Australia during 1997, it consisted of 72 families, which were from natural populations across Australia, PNG, Indonesia, and Indonesia, and also it consisted of superior trees selected in SSO, seeding seed orchards established in several countries. And uh, these seedlers were supplied by the uh, CSIRO. So it was of a broad genetic base. And also some uh, already some kind of improvement which has taken place in other countries, that uh, advantage was there in these uh, seedlots. And these seedlots were planted in uh, uh, two locations. There is a Karanya, uh, that is in Tamil Nadu, and another one is Nilambur in southern India during 1997. These families were evaluated for growth traits at 14 years of age, that's a 2011. And uh, wood density also we have taken for evaluation because uh, early, uh, our, some earlier our observations, 
the uh, revealed that uh, the heart, there is some relationship between wood density and the heart rot because acacia mansion is highly prone to heart rot where uh, the, the tree looks very normal but when you cut the trees or take the wood samples through the implement borers you will see in, inside the uh, trees hollow and uh, sometimes completely hollow and uh, it cannot be used at all so there is high incidence of heart rot, especially in high rainfall areas uh, in acacia mangium plantations. When we started uh, taking wood samples, what we found was the higher density trees were normal and uh, heart, rot incidence, heart rot incidence was less. And also acacia algae farmers, which is having higher wood density, is relatively free from this heart rot incidence in these areas. Therefore, we thought if we uh, try to see whether some families uh, which have higher wood density, we can use it in the advanced generation seed orchard, where we can improve for the wood density, and uh, which may reduce the heart rot incidence also, and uh, if even the per wood uh, quantity also it may increase because of good higher wood uh, weighting. So the final objective was of the study was to uh, develop advanced generation seed orchard. Uh, using the superior trees in the family, superior families, and also clones trials, and later establish the progeny trial, which can be converted into uh, advanced generation SSO. Next one, please. Yeah, this is uh, this is the details about the uh, trial. The one trial was the Nilambur in Kerala, that is in the uh, western side of the uh, uh, Kerala, where it is near to the coast. Uh, it consists of 71 families. Uh, the uh, rainfall is around 2,500 mm, and uh, it's a brown and uh, low altitude, uh, highly suited for the acacia mangium and brown loam area. And our carnia that was consists of 79 families, and it is 1,000 or less uh, mm rainfall. It's a little dry area, and the soil is also a little bit blackish clay, and of course uh, both of the trials consist of uh, fire application, four tree plot. Uh, was there and uh, next one please next clip please yeah yeah uh, this is a, a seal lot details we have csro seal lot numbers are also given and uh, there were native single trees of uh, seven seal lots uh, it consists of uh, dual emission QLV, which is four seal lots, and uh, others uh, one or two seal lots. And SSO selections were maximum 54 seal lots were there of different SSOs. And uh, the native bulk was five seal lots, each one from different uh, uh, provinces. And there were two controls. One was a local uh, control. This is a Mysore paper mill. This is a local uh, paper mill plantations uh, they had from that uh, seal lot we had taken. And acacia algae farmers was also taken as a control uh, to see how acacia algae for uh, uh, algae farmers performs uh, compared to the mangium. And there were uh, three Indonesian bulk uh, sesso bulk uh, seal lots uh, from the uh, Indonesian. Yeah, total 71 cellars were there. In Karunia, some of cellars, uh, 79 cellars were there. And totally here, including the, yeah, next one, please. Uh, yeah, uh, this is a mean performance of family trials at 14 years. Uh, you can clearly see the, the trials were measured for total height in meters and clear wall height. That, that the side stem straightness that was measured into one to five scale qualitatively and number of primary band branches mean survival and wood density wood density you could measure only in one uh, trial because other trial there was a lot of damage and only three replication we could take uh, in the carunia uh, and uh, we could not take the wood density and the data could not be analyzed the wood density data so we have taken only one uh, there's a nilam mode for wood density variation we come into the total height you can see clearly in the dry area, it was uh, just 12.71 meters at uh, uh, 14 years, but whereas in Nilambur, it was 34 meters mean height. And uh, even the clear wall height also, and girth was also better in the Nilambur. And some straightness was also a little better in the uh, Nilambur, uh, which is higher in fall. But the trees here in Karan and drier areas, there, there is some problem of cell pruning and uh, they were more branchy. 
the branches were more and the survival percentage was also better in nilambur almost 70 percent here it was around around 50 percent and wood density the mean wood density was 0.19 and it ranged from 0.446 to 0.60 the highest being the acacia arikli families uh, next one please Yeah, uh, with the nested analysis, uh, the seed source, the seed source uh, was used there, 18 seed source, the mean, and we can clearly see some of the SSO selections of uh, a from PNG, the Queensland, and uh, one native bulk. The seed source is comparatively better. And uh, the SSO Kurunda and the Queensland, Kumail, PNG, they also perform better in terms of clear bowl height also. But Akeshi Arikri farm is when it was planted along with the mangium, maybe it could not compete with the mangium during early growth and it was performance was very poor compared to the mangium and uh, in this high rainfall area, but it had high wood density. And coming to wood density, as such, uh, this uh, Indonesian seedlots were having a better wood density and also this uh, one uh, SSO selection from Kurunda, almost 0.56. And NPM, the local seedlot was also having a better wood density and Acacia Arikli Farmis was having around 0.6. And compared to the seed sources, overall performance of the SSO selections were better compared to the native bulk or native single trees or even the local seedlots. Uh, next one, please. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Tule Mission Beach, uh, compared to the uh, other uh, seed sources, uh, this Tule Mission Beach Queensland uh, was performing lower in all, uh, most, most of the characters. Yeah. Next one, please. This I already explained. Next one. Yeah. To see which exact which seed lots performed among the uh, 72 total, including the control. So uh, the Karunda PNG, most of the Karunda PNG seed lots of uh, 46 to 62 numbers, they were performing better. And we could uh, uh, shortlist some of the better seed lots here in this uh, source. And among the native tree selections, only one seed lot that was Kumavel performed better. And uh, for wood density, of course, the uh, all three Indonesian uh, bulk and also MPM performed better. And of course, Acacia Arikli Farmis performance was poor. Next one. The next, uh, the, another. Uh, Excuse me, Dr. Yeah. You have another two minutes to complete your presentation. Uh, yeah, I will, I will take five minutes. Yeah. Uh, two minutes, please. Okay. Okay, the, uh, in the Carnia, uh, which is a drier area, there was not much difference among the family statistically, but still the, like uh, previous one, Nilambur, the SSO selection of Karunda was better. Next one, please. And Akeshi Arikli Farmis uh, was performing better here in drier side compared to the Mangium. So, and uh, here, uh, only for some status, there was some statistical significance. Otherwise, uh, most of the uh, trees were uh, in the dry area, but not uh, much difference. But still, the Komawal PNG performance was better. Next one. Yeah, this is the heritability values. For total height, there was a moderate heritability 0.43, but uh, for other characters, there was uh, moderate uh, 0.36, but whereas for wood density, there was only 0.29 which means that uh, we have to take care of uh, not only individual selection, also family mean uh, to while selecting the uh, trees for wood density. Next one, please. Yeah, this is the, uh, in the Neelam bowl. Next one, please. Yeah, this, uh, we had taken the uh, wood samples through the increment borers. And uh, yeah, what are the displacement method we use for the uh, wood density measurement? Next one, please. And uh, this is a Caronia where you can see the trees were branchy and some families were performed very poor in the dry side. Next, next slide, please.
Yeah. The sum, uh, I summarize the, uh, this uh, selection process where this uh, main aim was to select the superior families for developing advanced generation seed orchard. And we were able to select some of the superior performing uh, families. And uh, for uh, wood density is also some families we, are, we were able to select the uh, seed lots. And overall performance was better, the maximum performance was better at high rainfall area, not the low rainfall area. But Acacia Arkley Farm is, was performing better in the drier side. Next one. Yeah. We could, uh, we, for the next generation, we could select some of the around 100 trees in these uh, family trials. And also for comparison, we did some few selection in the local plantations as around 28 trees. And uh, present trial was raised of uh, 125 trees in uh, Palo, which is high rainfall area, which was very much suited for mangium growth. And uh, here also up to two years, we measured the uh, growth traits and farm traits. Here, what we found that the SSO families which were performing better in Nilambur and Kar Karunya, which were of ATC, CSI or supplied seed lots, they were performing better on that pedigree compared to these local selections. Next one, please. Yeah, this is the uh, performance of the progeny trial where we can clearly see the overall performance was better and there was a good variation among the 125 uh, families in the uh, early uh, growth uh, traits, for early growth traits, next one, and also farm traits. Yeah, this is the heritability values. This heritability was moderate uh, for most of the characters. Next one, please. Yeah, this is the second year growth. You can see some of the families were uh, performing very good. Uh, that uh, growth-wise, also farm-wise. Next one. Uh, Dr. Uh, Maheshwa, uh, yeah, time may... is complete yeah. your presentation. So through uh, indirect, uh, so using this histograph, we could uh, measure the wood density in the, uh, in the family trial in the, at uh, two years age. And uh, next one, please. And we could uh, get good. Uh, I need to stop you, uh, doctor. Sorry, doctor. You, we are out, uh, running out of time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, any question? Uh, to these uh, uh, presentations uh, regarding the 14 years old uh, provenient trial uh, 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 experiment from India. I allow one question because we, we actually uh, over the time just now. Any questions on the floor? It's very interesting. They, uh, he's uh, actually doing a uh, testing a lot of seed, different seed lot. Probably can work with other uh, a country like Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, even in China. Uh, if no questions, thank you very much, Doctor. I'll pass back to our uh, MC for today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ong. We, but we will definitely will see you again in the afternoon to continue our sessions on genetic and breeding. A special thanks and congratulations to all speakers of these sessions. It's good to see again Dr. Arif, uh, Dr. Jeremy Bronner. Uh, thank you to Dr. Ken, Dr. Roger Anol, and Dr. Maheshwar. Ladies and gentlemen, we will be having our lunch break here and we will see you again at 2 p.m. Malaysia, or about approximately uh, one hour and uh, 10 minutes from now. Thank you so much.